Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. It's so good to see all your smiley faces. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for hanging out with us today on this episode. We've got an amazing guest coming in from Los Angeles. Justin Torkelson is here, you know, from The Bold and the Beautiful. Many years as Rick Forrester, of course, and also starring with another buddy of ours here, Sean Kanan, who's been a guest, I think, two or three times now on the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series. They star in Studio City, which, you know, we've talked about a lot on this show. And uh, we're waiting for possible footage we may be getting. That's why we started just a little bit later live. Just we wanted to see if we can get some footage coming in here, which is being produced right now. But uh, it's so good to see all of you. If this is your first time here, we welcome you. We welcome our Lovety Squad. The Lovety Squad are those who watch the Gym Master Show live all the time. And sometimes we do two shows a day. And we're just about at the 650 episode mark, which is absolutely unbelievable. I can't believe we've done almost 650 episodes live seven days a week of this cool series where we bring in guests from Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration. Uh, they come in from all around the world. We have an international audience and we have all of you, our lovely squad watching comments coming in left and right. Thanks to all of you who are fans of our show, fans of uh, Justin and his work, and fans of Studio City, The Bold and Beautiful, and everything else. We've got a nice merging of people here joining us on the broadcast today, and we absolutely love that. So thanks for uh, being with us. We really appreciate it. Again, if this is the very first time that you're joining us, we welcome you. We're here live just about seven days a week. And if you want to take a look at the archive and you want to binge watch some of our episodes, you'll see a lot of folks from a lot of the soap operas here, from the Waltons, from Happy Days. I mean, think of all the different TV shows. You'll see them from so many different uh, walks of life. Celebrity friends of mine that I've interviewed on uh, television nationally and so much more, uh, really cool stuff. So you can binge watch all of those episodes on our YouTube channel and we welcome and encourage you and would love it. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jim masters TV, that's where we house all these episodes and do the live show. And don't forget to click that notification bell. There's a little bell icon you see uh, right underneath the episodes. And you also see it uh, next to that subscribe word there, that red lettered word. Um, subscribe and also click the notification bell. So that way there you'll be alerted when we have all our episodes uh, and the time and, and who's on and all the rest. So make sure you click that. And of course, give our episodes that you enjoy a hearty and healthy thumbs up. There's a little thumbs up icon on our YouTube channel on all of the episodes, all of them. And leave a comment for us on the YouTube channel as well. That's big time. When you leave a comment for us, that really helps us in many, many different ways because YouTube loves to see that and YouTube then takes the episode and they blast it out to the world even further. Uh, for those of you watching for the first time, I work in television and radio and have for years on air as a host and, and so much more. And um, so this series sort of grew out of my professional work on the air on television and radio. Somebody who's uh, been doing the same on television is Justin. Yes, he is here. Actor, producer, of course, now you guys know as Rick Forrester, of course, for a long time on The Bold and the Beautiful. And of course, he's also starring with Sean Keenan in Studio City. But, you know, his background is uh, quite extensive. He's been doing this kind of work for a long time and he loves it. Now, when he was on Bold and Beautiful, of course, you super fans know he played the son of Eric Forrester and Brooke Logan, of course, in The Bold and the Beautiful. Currently, he is starring alongside actor-producer Sean Keenan as Jacob in that Amazon Prime series, Studio City. He received his first nomination in 2000 for his portrayal of Rick at the Young Star Awards for the Best Young Actor in a Daytime TV Series. 2001, he won a Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Younger Actor in a Drama Series and was consecutively nominated in the same category in 2002. He was also nominated at the Young Artist Awards in 2001 for Best Performance in a Daytime Series Young Actor. He was also nominated for a Soap Opera Digest Award for Outstanding Young Lead Actor in 2003. He was born and raised in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. 
Uh, he learned to ski at the age of two, continued to enjoy outdoor activities as he grew up, including things like uh, ski racing and ice hockey and track and skateboarding, rollerblading, mountain biking, and rock climbing. He also had a wonderful opportunity teaching handicapped folks uh, to ski, which I think is fantastic. Uh, Justin attended Boulder High, where he was an all-star baseball player, earned a uh, letter managing the girls' swim team, and he also dressed up as the school mascot. Yes, a Panther for football and basketball games. His first acting experience came about uh, after he answered an audition for a local dinner theater. And armed with just a Polaroid photo of himself, he won the lead child role in uh, Louis the King and I and uh, other local parts followed from there. And then again, of course, you know him from the Bold and Beautiful, but he also did commercial modeling and he landed an important campaign with Nautica who featured Justin modeling outdoor gear on their website and seven story billboards in Times Square and other locations in New York City and Chicago and Boston as well. And uh, TV talk show host Roseanne saw one of the ads and booked him as a guest on our show. And she put him through a dating game segment. <laughs> we'll talk about all that and uh, so much more. Uh, he's done commercials for Nintendo's Game Boy and, and lots more. He first came to the attention of uh, Bold and Beautiful when his agent sent in a tape for a, a different role and they remembered him when they were recasting the character of Rick Forrester. And again, the rest has been history. And of course, he's starring in Studio City at present with uh, another great guy. We're talking uh, Sean Canyon again, who I, it's, I think it's about three times that Sean has been a guest on the Gym Master Show Live. So Justin is here. I know some of you will probably call him Rick <laughs> after years of seeing him as Rick Forrester, but uh, anything works. Just join me in welcoming him to the show right now. And here he is. Hey, my friend, welcome to the show. Hey, Jim, thank you so much for having me on today. It's an honor to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Justin. And boy, you've really been active since age two, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very uh, energetic, busybody person. So my parents had to keep me occupied pretty much my entire life, starting very yeah. young. Yeah. <laughs> so so when did the acting bug actually bite you? I mean, obviously, you were very engrossed in athletics at an early yeah. age in Colorado. But when did you, you know, say, hey, acting is something that's turning me on here? That that was kind of random. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd spent my whole life in sports, skiing and all these things. Yeah. Winter sports were my jam, hockey and skiing and stuff. You know, I was a speed discipline skier and everybody kept growing and I didn't. <laughs> so everybody got to, <laughs> you know, everyone was pushing up towards six feet and everyone was getting really strong. And, and I just, you know, downhill, it relies on momentum. It's, it's your body weight. It's, it's all of your, you know, and so I just couldn't keep up and I wasn't into running moguls as much or slalom racing, all these kind of things. So I was a interest. I was kind of a weird kid. I read the newspaper every morning with my cereal and I saw an audition call for the King and I at our local dinner theater. And I was just like, Hey mom, can I, uh, can I go try that? And she was like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> like literally get out the Polaroid camera, take a picture <laughs> and send me in. And uh, yeah, that kind of, I think that planted the seed. I, I, had, I had never done like, school theater or anything like that it had never been my thing like you know i'd done some school like you know the participation things when you're a little kid and the yeah. choir and and those things but acting was never on my radar and then all of a sudden i was like i want to try this and i fell in love with it it's just such wow. a great way to express yourself i think that's what it was for me I fell anybody in love else it. in the family have this uh background or in the arts or entertainment at all you know, my aunt Carla is uh, an incredible concert pianist, a classical pianist, and she was with the New York Philharmonic and things like that. Oh, I would wow, say that's yeah. as, as artistic as, as other Torkelsons get. A lot of Torkelsons are practical and engineering minded <laughs> or politicians or, you know, those kind of things. So, right. right. I was kind of an oddball. Everybody was literally like. You're, you're an actor now? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what was the real early opportunity for you, Justin, that sort of got things in motion. You know, we all have the desire to do a lot of these things, but sometimes all of those uh, ducks have to be in a row. The timing yeah. has to be just right the, and everything else that they're looking for. And sometimes they don't even know what they're looking for. And then all of a sudden here you walk in and it's like, boom, tell us about that. You know, 
it's 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 like they say you know luck is a combination of preparation and timing it's it's never really completely luck but you have to be the way i feel is you have to be prepared when you maybe stumble into something you know yes um, right for instance with with the bold and the beautiful you know how, how it all kind of worked out there was I, I was finishing up. I did like one year of normal high school in Boulder. I was like, you know, I've been going to pilot season and doing all these things. And my life has been very, you know, set school and then this. And I was doing like children's movies with like, you know, actor friends of mine. And I'd be in Colorado. And so my senior year, I was like, I want to chill. I want to be like a normal year of high school with all my buddies and have a spring and a spring break and not Hollywood. And of course, the one year I decided to do that, then I end up like screen testing for Days of Our Lives. And then I end up, you know, getting a call from Brad Bell, you know, his people at Bold and Beautiful a couple of weeks after that. And all these things just kind of happened, you know, so it was like a combination of the timing was there and I'd been preparing to get a more permanent career position with acting all those years is what I've been working towards. So it's almost like I was ready. You know, I was, I was 18 turning 19. I was becoming an adult. I was ready for my first apartment. It all just kind of came together. Yeah. Um, but you know, in the youth, it was, when I was young, it was just something that I thought would be fun. And, you know, and then we were doing some theater, um, Jessica Biel and I actually, the actress, Jessica Biel, we were doing some theater yeah. in Colorado together and an agent had come in, uh, to visit her sister-in-law or something. And, and she literally came to us after the play. She's like, you guys should think about coming to Los Angeles. And yeah. it planted this seed and yeah. that little seed was planted there. And we were like 13. We were very young. We were still doing children's theater and all these kind of things. So wow. luckily we have supportive families. <laughs> See, that's the key, right? Is to have the supportive families. So, yeah. you know, you have that opportunity and things start rolling in the right direction. And then how did it end up coming to where the bold and the beautiful really became this, you know, really important thing in your life and then of course the role of rick forrester son yeah. of brooke and eric which again that sets things into uh motion kind of nicely yeah. huh yeah 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 you know uh it was a lot of pressure i don't know it was really funny because you know the, the soap opera came around i i spent my teenage years doing kind of little independent films, you know, roles on sitcoms, a couple of, you know, canceled shows, which happens to all of us, you know, which you do happens a, to you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. you know, we, we do a pilot and they cancel it and it's just, it's just how it works. And you just keep pushing and pushing and trying and that's your preparation. And all that preparation came to a head when bold and beautiful came mm -hmm. and they called and, you know, I, I was flown in from Colorado. Like I said, I was like, I was taking the year to have a normal spring break in summertime. So they flew me in, put me up in the hotel down the street from CBS. I did my screen test and it was all new to me because the only daytime TV I'd really seen was sometimes Price is Right when I was at home with the flu. Oh yeah. When I'm a little kid. Bob know? Barker. Yeah. Bob Barker. <laughs> Come on a, down. Awesome man, by the way. Really oh, funny guy. Yes. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So they brought me in and they put me in Bob Barker's dressing room next door for my screen test because all the right. other dressing rooms were occupied. I was like, I'm in Bob Barker's dressing room. This That's is legit. Cool. This <laughs> yeah. is it. Yeah. So, you know, I got there for the screen test and I remember the woman who played Kimberly, her mother was there because we were all young and her mother was there. And she's like, do you know about Bold and Beautiful? And I was like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? She's like, this is like one of the most popular television shows in the world. Yeah. And I was like, really? Like, I didn't know. And it's like all of a sudden this is sinking in like 10 yeah. minutes before my screen test. <laughs> right. So I'm sitting there going, wow. OK, this is like this is a big deal. I got to really get this together. And, but I mean, I was one thing I'm known for is being prepared. I was, over, yeah. I was over prepared, you know, but um, it, it, it kind of made it real. And it was like, okay, this is like big time. This is, you know, this is, this is the next level up basically. Mm. And it was, yeah. I mean, it's, it's work. It, it really is. Yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes the key to all of it is us making everything look so smooth and easy, but behind the scenes, there's so much yeah. intense work. And in soap yeah. operas or daytime drama, the amount of pages of script that you have to sort of memorize and all the different th crazy stuff that goes on and all, it, it gets pretty intense, doesn't it? It does. It's um, quite frankly, it was terrifying at first. It was uh, the first week they sent me all my scripts. You know, they would send you your scripts on Friday night for the week before. That's not guaranteeing that's what you're going to end up saying. That's the funny part is 
they might rewrite it the night before. So you spend all weekend preparing and I wanted to be prepared. So I would spend hours and hours and hours studying and not sleeping and preparing. But your brain is a muscle. And the more you memorize things, you get used to it. And then you get to know your character and you get to know and it becomes easier and more fun and more exciting. And it's just step by step, minute by minute effort behind the scenes. There's more, it's almost harder work preparing if you're really work, if you're really preparing than it is to shoot the scene. Because when you're in the scene, it's natural. You're on a set, you're with the person you work with. There's a comfort there. Yeah. But sitting at home, reading the script and preparing and maybe the mirror, however an actor prepares, it's not natural. So it's, 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 it's a process to learn, but now you can throw 20 pages of dialogue at me and I'll memorize it in 10 minutes. And here we go. It's, it's, it's a whole different <laughs> thing, but that took many, many, many years. <laughs> it takes, we're exactly right. It takes time. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is uh, really, really cool stuff. I mean, a little behind the scenes understanding of it all. we got some cool photos through the hey. years. Look at that shot, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. The memories. This must be our first wedding for Rick and Amber. And that's Eric and Stephanie. My mother is nowhere to be found on the, you know, my TV mother. It's amazing to see these photos. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, was such it, a baby. I've been 20 there, I bet. 19, 20. Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As wow. Uh, the Forrester family. That's something. It's amazing. Huh? It is. That's really something. List it's, out it's for, the, for the audience uh, who's with you in these shots. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we've got Ron Moss, the man, the myth, the legend. Yes. Right? Yep. Um, let's see. We've got John McCook. He played my father. Stephanie is my stepmother and is the mother of Thorn and Ridge. And then, and my sister down here too. So, okay. So I'm trying to remember, this is so many years ago. Oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> so Jennifer yeah. Finnegan's doing a bunch of stuff. Tracy played my sister, my, my half sister, because she was Stephanie's daughter as well. And then yeah. there was Rick and Bridget who were Brooke Logan's kid. <laughs> so right. we came in to mess everything up. You know, dad, <laughs> dad got around apparently. <laughs> I think so, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the is drama. funny. Yes. Yeah. But you got around too, huh? Hey, On the magazines. Yes, and, yes uh... <laughs> I did. That's, that what was, was that like cover. back home in Colorado for the family when they started to see – you know, all of this adulation, all this attention, uh, you know, on the magazines, on television, all the, the you know, the rabid uh, soap fans that love their soaps and their stars. They love their, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what was it like back home in Colorado for the family? Were they like, wow? Uh, or when you went back to Colorado, were they just very settling? Like you're back home and, you know, you're just just in and let's toss the ball around or whatever, right? Yeah, I think you hit that on the head. I think family time is very settling and friend time. You know, I, I have friends. I have a very small group of friends, but friends that go back all the way to high school and, and middle school. And, you know, those are the friends that will tell you like it is. Oh, my God. <laughs> the drama. It's so serious. <laughs> I guess you know, that is funny. It's funny because I spent most of my mid teens, you know, like I said, doing failed sitcoms and this and that and stand up <laughs> comedy. So how I ended up on a soap, who knows, but it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> but as I, as I was saying, my friend. So there's you with family. Sean Kanan, of course, our buddy Sean. Yes. And then there's in the Sean. middle. Is... Yeah, so that's, that's, um, that is, she played my sister, Bridget. So that was your sister then. Yeah. Yep. Look yeah, at so Sean's expression. Finnegan. Oh yeah. I don't so think you'd want to mess with Sean. <laughs> Sean and I, our characters were always butting heads. The funny thing is my character, Rick brought Deacon, Sean's character on to bold and beautiful thinking ah, that it's right because he had had a son with my wife's cousin and my wife, <laughs> as one does, my wife stole the baby, you know, and passed it off. <laughs> of course, <laughs> because she had slept with me and Usher. So she didn't know who the baby was. Well, it was my baby, but it was stillborn. And coincidentally, her cousin had a baby next door. So she stole it. <laughs> so when, when her cousin wanted the baby back, I went and uh, I found Deacon. And I said, hey, I'll give you some money and I'll give you some power and this and that if you give me custody of, of little Eric. And he's like, no, that's cool. I want my baby. And I'm going to sleep with your mom and your sister and all your friends. <laughs> And, and the, the fact that you're still friends today. <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, 
Sean is, I would have to say, my closest friend from both yes. we've, we've stayed in touch all these years. Well, it's kind of kind of cool. Like you said, you sort of brought him on to the show, and then yeah. he brought you on Studio City. So, yes, he did. I mean, isn't that great? Kind of full circle. It all, you know, it was it was uh, it was a really amazing time. I remember when Sean started Bold and Beautiful, you know, and and they called and they said, you know, there's a new character coming in, Deacon, and all this, and Sean and I just hit it off. We, you know. He was, he was coming off. I think he had been on general hospital and he had some good momentum general with some hospital, other things. Yeah. Yep. And, and so he came in and he was really killing it. He had a really, yeah. really juicy character. Yeah. And so we got some really good scenes together and it made us spend time together and we just became really good friends. You know, it's, it's some people, your acquaintances, some people you become really good friends and it depends on how you shoot, you know, Bold and Beautiful is a small family. You, you see really these pictures. Is. Yeah. Our cast isn't much bigger than that. Even now the cast isn't that big. And so yeah. Yeah. everybody gets, at that time at least, every, everybody was pretty close to each other. Which is great. And, and even you've garnered uh, a nice little award there, huh? <laughs> yes, I did. That was such a fun night. That was... Um, what was that like? Whew, that was... A complete and total surprise. <laughs> that's uh, the daytime Emmy award there. He's yep. holding friends. Yes. Yep. That's, that's a daytime Emmy. And um, I should, you know, the odds were all against me. I should have bet on myself in Vegas on that one. I would have made a pretty penny uh, because I was, <laughs> I was a new, I was new. I was, yeah. it was pretty much, I'd been in for a little over a year. I think I was really, really new. And it kind of was unexpected. Like it was so unexpected that I didn't have any lighting in the show. When it cut to me for the pre-shot, there was no lighting on me. <laughs> they were like, no, no, he's not going to win it. Um, but Adrian and I on there on screen, we had had some scenes together, some epic life-changing scenes that you only get very rarely in your career. And yeah. we nailed them together. We did it together. If it was yeah. anyone else, I don't think yeah. we would have been able to do it. Yeah. The chemistry yeah. was there. And yeah. uh, do you stay in touch with the gang from uh, the bold and the beautiful? Does everybody I still do. stay connected and in touch? For the most part, you know, some people come in and out over the years, but you know, I, I, I go, I've been up to Carney's on sunset Boulevard with John McCook. We've had hot dogs and we catch up and talk about life. You know, Catherine Kelly Lang has a leather goods store in Beverly Hills. And so you can drop by and see her, you know, um, but I'd say Sean is my closest friend. Um, and then some of the production staff and stuff I've stayed in touch with as well. But at that time, that was really at the kind of when the frenzy started with the, mm -hmm. the, the notoriety of Bold and Beautiful and the, yeah. the worldwide fame. It really, late 90s through the mid 2000s, we really exploded. And sharing that experience, you know, we went to, I think I'd been on the show for maybe three months and we went to Venice, Italy and filmed for a month. And this is like a Midwestern boy who'd never, you know, I'd been to Canada to ski. Like that was it, you know, probably so not getting, even to Venice beach, California yeah, by then. Where I yeah. live now. Yeah. I'd never <laughs> even driven to Venice beach. Exactly. And so all of a sudden they're flying me to Venice and they're like, wait till you see this. And there's like 800 people outside of the hotel at five o'clock in the morning. In the like, morning. This is crazy. Lined yeah. up, ready to go, you know? Yep. Yeah. So what was that experience like being flown to Venice? I was there on a PBS television shoot project Ooh. and it was fantastic. Yeah. Venice is, Italy is spectacular. You know, I, I, I've had the good fortune because of the show and just the way my life's worked out. I've gotten to travel a lot and uh, you know, Italy is one of my favorite places to go. Obviously, yeah. you know, I've spent a lot of time there. I've worked there a lot, um, but bold and beautiful. The, the, the appeal of it is it's sent, they sent me all over the world. Yes really a blessing i got to take my dad to australia for a month wow like, you know that's special you that's know because very they, special they'd get you a companion ticket and it's for a long trip they say bring somebody and i was like dad come with me yeah like that is so fortunate like, isn't that incredible yeah wow that's that's yeah. awesome when you look back at the bold and the beautiful like you said you just listed out some of the interesting and crazy scenarios that have happened in in terms of the uh the scripts and, and what you had to do. We've had a number of soap opera uh, stars come through and I've asked them, you know, do you ever have a situation where you get so attached to the character that you're playing, where you're very protective of the character and you're almost like, and some of them have said, sometimes they would say, gee, she, you know, she would never do that or he would never do that. Or 
do we really have to have them, you know, jump off the bridge or, you know, yeah. different things like that? Yeah. Have you ever had any opportunity to uh, have input or, or have a thought of your take on the character? Because you get so close in this case to who Rick Forrester was uh, for you. Mm-hmm. How does that work? And, and you know, because sometimes you can get into some really interesting scenarios with the characters, especially on the daytime yes. dramas. Oh, yeah. Especially on the daytime dramas. I. You know, I think for me, it, it um, in my personal instance, you, I did. I, I connected with Rick in some ways, and there's other things that I didn't relate to with Rick. You know, Rick Rick had a very different upbringing as a child than I did, for instance. And so that was the fun challenge, is to create kind of this narrative. And you do you become you become very personally attached to your character, especially in daytime, like you were men- mentioning, because it's it's um you're attached to this character every single day. You work with this character day in and day out. And, and, you know, I took over from somebody and then somebody came and took over from me, which is another interesting thing in daytime is the characters keep going. Like my character, you know, I went to the run the Paris office and a new guy came back. Um, So you want to come in and take a character and make it yours and put your stamp on it and really try and hold to that. And I think what's really nice about a place like Bold and Beautiful and being a smaller set and, being a more close knit group is I feel like we had some room and some leeway to say, Hey, you know, I don't know if if Rick would do that, or that makes me uncomfortable playing it that way. You know, I I think it won't read right. And, and sometimes you compromise and sometimes you have to do what you're told. And sometimes they change it. You know, it's, it's the key to a a good production is being able to communicate with everybody through every level from the top to the bottom if everybody can talk you can make a good production even if you don't have any money even if you have all the money in the world you have to communicate yes exactly right exactly and it does become like a family in a way doesn't it i mean you have yes. even with the crew you see the crew the camera people and everybody oh, yeah. the lighting directors every day several days a week because you know these are five day a week shows and yep. 30 years on air plus some of them yeah. so it really becomes um a family in in such an incredible way huh it does it's um you know when you think of like i went to visit a couple years ago pre-pandemic i went back to visit the set at bold and beautiful and i hadn't been back for years you know i about 2008 i kind of walked away from a lot of stuff i had been working a lot since i was a young kid and i moved to you know i moved to italy (laughs) i was like peace i'm out like i i went so you just uh, like reached a certain point where you were like okay i think i want to explore who justin is now i've played all these roles now i want to find out who justin is and justin wants to enjoy himself it was almost like i felt like i had to go out and grow up a little bit you know because Mm. uh, you know i I remember talking you know i was talking to like a, a psychologist once and they were saying there's like an actual proven thing with people who like get kind of famous in a way they kind of stop at that age, you know? So like I was a teenager and all of a sudden your life really changes. And I didn't stop as a teenager. I, I, I'm still a very young person now, I think because of the way my life has gone, but I kind of went backwards. So, but then by 28, I was like, you know, I, I've been doing all this work as characters and these things. And as an yeah, actor, right. now I want to go and find myself. And right. all that has done, in my opinion, is given me some life experience. It's made me a better actor. Because exactly. you can sit and you can talk your process all night long with all your other actor buddies, but until you have some pain inside, until mm-hmm. you have some life experience, it's never going to read as much as manufacturing it. It won't read as well. Exactly you know? right. Yeah. So where did you live in Italy? <laughs> uh, mainly in Bologna. Um, Very nice. <laughs> yep. Spent some time in Pescara as well. Um, because of Bold and Beautiful, I started working for a company there called Radiosa, and they made tuxedos and wedding dresses. They were kind of the David's Bridal of Europe. You know, they were affordable and, you know, uh, a very successful company. And Ron Moss handed the job down to me from, he was on Bold and Beautiful, he played Ridge, and he handed right. it down to me because he's like, I'm, I'm moving on from this job, and I suggested you should do it. And I was like, totally, I'm totally down. So after we filmed in Venice, I went and did a fashion show with this company, Radiosa, and the the son of the owner, a guy named Rocky Molas, his son, Ramiro, and I became best friends. And he is, you know, family. You know, mm-hmm. there's a couple of people from Italy that I consider family at this point. And then Ramiro is one of them. And so when it had all tied up, I was like, hey, Ramiro, I'm, 
I'm looking to make some life changes. I'm like, can I come visit? He's like, come and stay as long as you want. And that was the start of it. And then I bought an old car and I drove all around Europe and I just did my thing. And I was like, you know, I just, whatever I wanted and to. You were how it. old around that time? About 28, I'd say. Yeah. It would be 2008. The end of the year, I was just maybe 28, 29. Good yeah. time to do that, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I had a really good time. <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. So then, when did you decide to come back to the states? Were you craving the work again? What What brought you back here? You know, well, I was in and out. I was never like permanently there. You know, I had an apartment in Bologna, and I was in and out. Um, I met I met somebody, and we were you know we were together, and ran off and got married. And long story, don't want to talk about. It. <laughs> Just kidding. But long story short. Um, Came back to America, yeah, because, you know, eventually the the main thing for me is I'm an actor, you know, and I wanted to go out and experience some life and have some fun, but I'm an actor. And to really yeah. be an actor, you have to be in Los Angeles or New York. Yeah. It's just the way it is. There's only so much I could do from Italy. <laughs> exactly know? right. Now, did yeah. you pick up any Italian when you were there? Because when I was there, I noticed that when you turn on the television and the radio, everything really is in Italian. and. Yeah. There's not as much English as maybe in some other countries with the translations. Yeah. Did yeah. you pick up any Italian to get through? For sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I got pretty good. You know, I, I would say I'd speak like a 12-year-old a about now. You know, my grammar is pretty bad, but I know all the words. <laughs> so, <laughs> <kind of> <laughs> so I, you know, I I can communicate, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm perfectly good. I, I used to be better at it. It's languages you have to practice, you know. It's, yeah. You know, I... I, I uh, my wife is Israeli, and so I'm learning Hebrew, and that's that's a hard one. <laughs> that it just it doesn't relate really to a cool. Latin language. Yeah, right. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you never know if a role comes along where they they need some of that. Uh... <laughs> It'll be great. Italian. Yeah. I can say I can speak Italian. I can speak Hebrew. These are all good things. I, I can't I, speak Hebrew yet. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want. The, I don't want her to have a secret language with our children either. <laughs> you. Exactly right. Without telling you, um, yeah. what are some of your favorite episodes of the Bold and the Beautiful that really stand out? That they just really were enjoyable, or you really liked the storyline, whatever it may be. What are some personal favorites for you, Justin? For me, for me would be, you know, anything I did with Adrian Frantz, Um, because we had you know, Rick and Amber, we had really good chemistry. Like people still message me on Instagram and things about this, you know, 20 years later, after the fact, they're like, when are you coming back with Amber? You guys had chemistry. I'm like, dang, I appreciate your commitment and your following, you know? Um, those were some of the most challenging, you know, when we lost, when, when we lost the baby, when she had to tell me that yeah. those, that's where we won our Emmys, where she had to tell me that, she had to give our child back to her cousin and I had to say goodbye to my child. And it was one of those moments where just everything comes together and we both just royally killed it. I remember our supervising producer, Rhonda Friedman came out and we just done one take and Rhonda sat with me and she's like, that was fine. We can keep that. And she's like, I feel like there's just one more. <laughs> and I remember just being on the verge and I was already so emotional, but I was like, yeah, yeah, there's another one, you know, like, <laughs> we get some eye drops and get my eyes clear again. And we did it once more and it just, we both nailed it. It was like, shut the door on that one, you know, killed it. And uh, those were some of the best. And then when we went and filmed, that was all in, tied into when we went to film in Venice. Oh, that, yeah. You know, who doesn't want to be on location for three weeks in Venice, Italy, I filming tell a you. television show? Yes. I mean, it's almost like the population of Venice almost doubled every day with people coming in to see us. It was just such a neat experience. Yes. It's really yeah. cool, isn't it? I mean, when you have an opportunity to do that, I mean, it's it's extraordinary. What are some other places where you would love to travel to, whether it's just, you know, family vacation mm -hmm. uh, or it's part of an actual television or film project? Places that you'd love to, that are on your bucket list, Justin? Big bucket list places, Antarctica. That's a huge one, which I know is weird, but uh, I love I love the cold. But Antarctica has been on my list because I feel like the way the world is changing and with global warming and all these things, it's not going to be the place that it once was. And and it's a special place. It's untouched by war and all these bad things that are happening in the world. Um, South America. So I'd like an actual goal of mine would be I'd like to drive all the way through like the spine of South America, and I'd like to see all of that all the way 
to the farthest southern point I can and then go to Antarctica from there. Something like that would be an amazing, I mean, you know, we're talking thousands and thousands of miles of driving and it would be a commitment. Maybe I'll make a documentary, you know, you but know? yeah, that's, like that's I should go along, thing. film it yeah, as you yeah. go along. Yeah. Why not? I mean, Which, people love yeah. that kind of stuff. Oh, they do. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, that, that's cool. That's great that you want to do that. So, yeah. you know, and then the bold and the beautiful is there. And then when did it, how did it happen where you decided not to stay on the show? Were you, you know, it's funny because a lot of the shows, like you mentioned earlier, they'll send somebody off to the Paris office or to the Sydney office or to the London yeah. office. I remember yes. on another world, they did that a lot. They had the Corey publishing empire with Mac yes. and Rachel Corey. <laughs> and whenever there was somebody that was in, if they were gone for a while, Oh, they're now going to take care of, they're going to be head of advertising for the London office of Corey publishing, yeah. which they don't want to necessarily get rid of the character. They want to leave yep. that opportunity for the character to, but well, then again, if the character's killed off, they somehow come back once in a while too. <laughs> well, it's maybe a miracle. That wasn't really, you know, <laughs> yeah. no, that no, marshmallow really he die. ate really wasn't toxic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or they bring back the double or the evil brother, or the evil sister, but oh, they yeah. do send them overseas. How about for you? Uh, was it uh, a mutual thing? when you decided, okay, you know, the Rick Forrester role, which, which is fantastic. And I, I know you're very attached to it. Um, yeah. How did it happen where you decided, okay, you know, time to move on I now. I think, you know, we had, my contract was up, you know, we had multiple contract, you know, we had multiple year deals, usually a three year, three year deal. And, and so we were up for a renewal and um, I think it was almost kind of mutual in a way, you yeah. know, I, I had some things I wanted to do and try and see. Um, yeah. Some other challenges and, you wanted to take on. Yeah, you know, I I wanted to I wanted to produce a film myself, you know, the, these kind of things. Um, yeah, you know, and then then they had started talking about some storylines with Rick Forrester who might be singing and some things like this, and I'm like, mm, I'm not much of a singer, <laughs> you know. Uh, it just kind of seemed to work out at the time, and you know, that's what I did after I left. Is is um, I produced a movie, and you know, I, I funded it and did the whole thing, and it was a really great experience. I learned I don't ever want to fund a movie again because you spend all day telling people oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Funding like, no, is... you, we're not bringing the crane to Santa Barbara. It's three thousand dollars a day. If you need an establishing shot, go up a ladder. You know, it's like yeah. it's just, eventually it was like. Uh, <laughs> so I did that. I like production. I love being behind the scenes. You like the behind um, the scenes, yeah. Yep, and I like acting, and so. The ultimate goal for me is to still be an actor. You know, yeah. the, the other things are producing and these are kind of side hustles. The other businesses I have going, it's it's allowing me to pursue being an actor because it's my passion. And it's, I think as life works out more that direction, it's nice because then it's, you get to be an actor because you enjoy it purely for the passion exactly of it. Right. And also yeah. in the early years, uh, and I'm sure probably still have the ability and opportunity to do modeling as well, taking mm -hmm. you to the, uh, Soaring above the skyline there in New York City in Times Square <laughs> and working yeah. with Nautica and all these other names. Tell us about yeah. that. Uh, that's kind of that, cool too, huh? That was really cool. That was funny. I I always kept a, in high school. This all happened, you know, I started acting in kind of middle school age, you know, 13-ish middle school. Never told anybody. There wasn't, it was never a thing of like, hey, come see my play at Boulder Dinner Theater. So sometimes my friends would see it or their parents would see me and be like, you know, your classmate is in school. And it went that way in high school. I never did school theater and I never talked about what I did. And so randomly people would see me on a TV show or something and people knew I was an actor, but then it became really real to all of my peers and like people at school. Like one of the girls went to New York city and I had just done this Nautica campaign and there was this massive billboard <laughs> that covered the entire side of a building. And she took a picture of it and it went in the school paper. And it was like, you know, Justin Torkelson does this. And everyone was like, what? Like, we didn't know you did this, um, but that was really fun. That was my first, maybe where you get some kind of like notoriety for something, you know, it was like, it was a big campaign. Nautica was launching all these new clothes and they were going after the sports market and young people. And it was like, I had this skateboard and it was all hip and young and, and like everybody saw it. It was yeah. really cool. Like the side yeah. of buses and billboards and my family in Boston where my whole family is, you know, my, they're all East coast and, you know, my little cousins are texting me. They're like 12. They're like, look at you're on the bus. It was really cool. 
It was a really neat experience. And did Roseanne see it or did it come across Roseanne? Uh, yeah, that's Roseanne was, Barr, right? She saw it? Yeah, yeah. It was, she well, she was doing the talk, Barr. the daytime talk show. Yeah. Yep. It was her talk show. And she, it came across her desk. I don't know if a producer or she saw it or something, but it came across her desk and she was like, oh, let's get this kid on. We're doing a dating game, like a dating show, and it'll just be fun. You bring on this model guy. And then there was like the regular dude. And the whole point was to get the regular dude to date to prom. I was just this prop basically. And it was really entertaining. <laughs> it was like, why am I here? What am I doing? I'll answer these dating game questions. And then they're like, all right, get off the stage. You lost. And I'm like, what was I competing for? I didn't know what I was doing. It was just sit there. It was sit there and be pretty. But the That's exposure so <laughs> was, it was the exposure good. Yeah. Did that kick things up a little bit or? Yeah. The, 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 hi everybody. That the exposure was uh, excellent. Um, uh, just, you know, anytime you can get, publicity and you can get yourself in front of the camera it's 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 important and for yeah. what we do because people have very limited attention span you know they I mean, really do yeah you know I, this is a whole new coming back into this uh, the past year the pandemic put a, a big wrench in the spokes of me restarting my career um i just moved back to la and i was getting started and the pandemic hit and i was like mm. okay here we are. It is what it is. Where were That's you before okay. LA? Uh, when you were, uh, I'd been in Colorado for a bit. I was you in LA. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I was a little antsy. I wasn't doing any acting work or anything. So I went back to Colorado for a bit. I was helping my dad remodel the house. I wanted to spend a winter skiing and all that. And then I, I came back, you know, and in between all this, I'd met my wife and she was in Israel and it was like long distance, just all this crazy, crazy stuff. How did you and guys meet? You and your wife. We met. We met here in LA. We met yeah. at like an HBO party. She's in the television industry as well. She's Israeli, and she was here for some work and looking for work and doing some things. And we met at a function, and we just mm. hit it off, and we became really amazing friends. But she's like, "Well, I got to go back to Israel," and I was like, eh, "That's far. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's really far away." So we, I mean, we stayed in touch, and you know, we talked almost every day. And but we were just amazing friends. And then one time, it was just like. She was just like, hey, I, I, I want to come visit. You know, I'm coming to America. Let's visit. And it was just like, just stay. You know, we love each other. Yeah. And so it was, you know, and this all went on during the pandemic. It's just all this. The pandemic was a crazy time. It put a lot of breaks on things, but it also really, I thrived in a way because it's yeah. let me set up to where I want to be now. You know? Yeah, you know, I, I've asked this of a lot of people, not just on this show, but in other stuff that I do and, and TV and radio and even just in regular conversations with friends and family. What uh, for you? I mean, during this time, we're, we're all used to being busy and either in studios or on location sets, whatever. Lots of people around, lots of activity happening for you. What are some of the things that Justin, you know, Justin learned a lot about Justin when he packed up from Hollywood and went to Italy. But now we had this two year plus period of reflection and really looking inward at ourselves and looking at the world around us. And it gave us some time to be able to also say, gee, what do I want to do going forward? What do I want to do next? What are some things I want to do that maybe, you know, inspire me, inspire others at the same time? You've seen a lot of people they're changing careers. They're coming yeah. up with entrepreneurial things. Yep. What did Justin learn about Justin during this time of great reflection? <laughs> Ooh, I learned a lot. I learned a yeah. lot. And I, I imagine most people, I don't think you'd find anybody who went through this pandemic that won't say, Hey, I learned something about myself. I learned yeah. something, you know, um, you know, for me, I, it was really scary at first. You know, I remember it just, obviously it was terrifying for everybody, just the whole, the, the unknown and the fear. Um, and I remember it was like the lockdowns came to LA and it was mm. just like, you need to stay in and this. And then it was like, okay, well, we live a block from the ocean. So it was like, that's cool. We'll still go to the ocean and get, you know, and then they're like, no, no, you can't leave your house. And that's like, that's when my wife and I went back to Colorado because my parents have some space so we could exercise and whatever. But for me, what I found it was the challenge of just occupying oneself. And, and to me, I, to me, it was even more growing up because it was just like, I've, I learned in a lot of ways how to just be calm with just being, you know, and understanding, I think it gave a greater understanding of really just how much in our lives is out of our hands. Uh, you know, we can't control 
a pandemic when this happens, what happens. So we need to be able to react and be prepared to react as best as we can to these things. Um, I found new hobbies. I started exercising. I, I started building vintage bicycles. Like I'm a huge car freak and I like building things and I don't have the space here to play with cars because I have, you know, two spaces and it's, I don't have the space here in LA. So I was like, I'm going to build vintage bicycles. And this is weird because wow. I mountain biked in like when I was a kid, but yeah. I, it never crossed. I don't know if I'm having a midlife crisis. Maybe that's what it is. But like I started getting on Craigslist and buying old bikes and I'm like, I'm going to learn how this works. And so oh, that's then I cool. Them. Yeah. That cool. And then it became a passion. And now I ride over a hundred, maybe 200 miles a week. And I have like six. Do you bikes really? it's, yeah. It's like one of my favorite. I had a huge accident in November. I'm recovering from. Oh, you but, did? Um, yeah. Yeah. I went over the handlebars going real fast <laughs> and I have a, I have a new collarbone. You see the scar there? <laughs> so I have a new plate in my collarbone and I have a new wrist. I have a plate in my wrist. And that matches the plates in my arms from my skiing injuries and the pins in my ankle from <laughs> notice how gang how he says it so nonchalantly. <laughs> <laughs> my doctor says I'm missing the gene for self-preservation. <laughs> Which is why I'm always skiing at 90 miles an so hour. You, wait, my you haven't done any years. Iron Man's or any of that yet? Not yet. My first big thing I'm hoping for in June, I, I need to start fundraising for is um, I want to do the AIDS ride, the California AIDS ride, which is from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And uh, it's a fundraiser for a good cause doing something I love. And I want to register and it's, it's something I've been wanting to do. And I didn't know if I'd be able to because of my accident, but I'm yeah. making enough recovery that I think I'll be able to because it's like 500 miles in six days. It's a long ride. Oh, that's so. yeah. That that really is something when you think about it, huh? To be yeah, able yeah. to uh, to do all of that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. And when would we have had time to do these things to find new hobbies? My my wife is a television creator, and we, you know we had written a series together years ago, and we we refined it, you know, and that's something we want to shoot and make. And um, I got it. I got into entrepreneurship. My one of my closest friends is an infectious disease expert at USC. And he just retired from there. Pandemic hits and he contracts with L.A. County to vaccinate people in L.A. County. And we vaccinated hundreds of thousands of people in this town. I've wow. never been in the medical industry, but he said, hey, you're a people person. Yeah. Do my logistics. We, we serve underserved communities and we help people get vaccinated who maybe would have had a hard time. And it was an interesting experience. So you learn some humanity and, and you. The pandemic was an interesting time. And, and I feel like I've come out on the other end of this, the better for it. And I don't think we're through with this pandemic yet. I think there's going to be some surges and some scares. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we definitely have uh, some time that's still happening and, you know, we, we've all had to pivot and we've all had yeah. to sort of just, you How know. about you? Did, did you add, did you add some new programs? What did you add into your repertoire during the pandemic? Like, did you add some new stuff? Cause I know you're always busy as it is. <laughs> This show, this series, believe it or not, That's this so cool. series, uh, w which has been interesting because we started it in April. We're actually coming up on our two year anniversary towards the end yeah. of this month. And we've done, we are, I think, one episode away from 650 of them in That's a two amazing. year period. Uh, now, for people to understand that, there are shows, there are series, there's Broadway runs, there are television shows, and where it could take you know, 10 years to get yep. to 650 episodes of something. It, it took me almost eight years of Bold and Beautiful to do, to get to 750. I mean, that's a lot of hard work you've done in two years. <laughs> in two years, 650 episodes. It's unbelievable. And, and it's not even the full time, you know, it's, there's the day job in television yeah. and radio with the different shows yeah. and stuff, yeah. but it's been terrific because, you know, first I started where I was hosting and talking to the camera and, you know, people started popping on. And then I started bringing in guests, people that I've interviewed before on PBS and other places, Hey, you want to pop yeah. on? And then they liked it. They started telling their friends and then it just starts rolling. And now it's where, uh, PR people and agents and managers and reps, love the show, the format, the style, and, and they're sending, they send their folks our way as well, uh, yeah. which I think is cool. But a lot happens where, you know, well, like Sean, you know, was uh, the entree, fantastic yeah. Sean. He, you know, I think that that's great. That's, that's some of the best when that happens that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, falling into things in life. Sometimes I feel like that's, God or whatever your whatever it is for you up there is 
saying, this might be a path for you. You need to try this. You know, when you fall into something, I, I fell into this, you know, into this vaccination thing and I really enjoyed it. And then, you know, I, through this, I ended up getting in touch with people and now I'm getting into the home testing business. You know, we were looking at COVID tests, but you know, people are learning now that, you know, you can take a test for almost anything at home. And sometimes it has to be sent to a lab, but you can get instant results for things like influenza, strep throat, all these things. And so for instance, I'm working with a company in Israel and my goal is to start bringing some of these things to America. You know, who would have thought I'd be in medical devices ever in my life, you know, but some of the things I've learned as an actor have helped me because I'm not a medical expert, but I learned how yeah. to put people together through producing and things, how to make a team. So I have yeah. a core leadership team. I have the business expert an FDA expert, an infectious disease specialist, you know, where we have five people covering all the major bases we need to cover. And I would have never even been able to do that if it weren't for the gifts from acting, learning how to organize and producing and all these things and not being afraid to just talk to people. Right. You know? um, and fortunately through some connections and some hard work, you know, we have a company and we're starting it now. It's, and that's the side hustle. And what I want to do is if this works out, it could be a lucrative business and I want to return. I want to, invest in the arts. I want to make movies. I want to help people right. get work who might not have otherwise had it. The ultimate goal is to keep in the arts, you know, this yes. is a means to an end, but it's also fun. So you like to do things that also uh, lift people up and empower them and motivate them and inspire yeah. them uh, as much as it's all entertaining and fun and a lot of work. You also like to do things that, uh, that matter and run deep, huh? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do. And, you know, I got I got into comedy and stand up comedy, for instance, when I was young, because, you know, I know what it likes. I know what it's like to feel sad or to feel rejection and all these kind of things. It's a part of being an actor. And, you know, if I have been given a talent to make people laugh, you know, I wanted to share that because if you can take that one night and get someone out of their head and just let them laugh a little bit, maybe it changes just a little something for them, you know, or you get letters from from people who watch Bold and Beautiful all those years, dedicated, incredible fans, you know, who still are there and support me. And you guys know who you are, who have supported me all these years through all of my ups and downs and all of my adventures and everything that I've done. You know, these things are just a blessing. And, and I don't know, I, I never expected how these things would work out in my life, but it all came together. You know, each path, Bold and Beautiful, I didn't go in for a regular audition. It wasn't me going into the office with all the people, how it usually was 800 times before in my career. It came around in a roundabout way. It was whoever's up there, whatever it is, pointing you in that direction, saying, mm. hey, you need to go this way. You know, and yeah. then the pandemic hits, hey, you need to go this way. And, you know, the company, a medical company is out of Israel. My wife is Israeli. It all just fits. You need to go this way, you know, and I'm the biggest thing I think I might've learned during the pandemic is take a step back and just let life flow a little bit. Maybe not try to control it so much. Are you a perfectionist? I can be. Yes. Yeah. I think <laughs> a lot detriment. of people in our industries are um, perfectionists. Yes. Are you as well? <laughs> I would say yes to a degree. Yeah. And I think that it's one of the, th there's a lot of people in our industry that also have OCD too. <laughs> you, yes. Oh, you know, yes. And, and I think um, it's because it attracts this uh, ability to have to get it right to, yes. you know, this, these industries demand perfection. They demand yeah. everything yeah. to be on time, yeah. look good, be right. Let's get it done. Yeah. We don't have a lot of time to dilly dally. We got to get in there and do it and make time it is look money, good. Time is money. Time is money. Time is money. Make it look good. Make it sound good. Make it feel good and get out there and make magic. And yeah. there is something about that that is in adrenaline inducing. And that's yeah. why I love to do things live. Many years yeah. of my oh, TV and radio work. Yeah. I, I love live stuff, live television, live radio, live anything stage, yep. because uh, literally, I, I know there's some people, they fear live. You know, I've asked people, <laughs> even my professional work, they're like, is it going to be live? I'm like, yeah, yeah that, that structure of that particular show happens <laughs> yeah, to be yeah, yeah. live, but yeah. don't worry, I'm here if something happens or I sense intuitively that you're you're losing your place or you're going to go down for the count. I'll give a nudge quietly just without putting the light on me. I'll just yeah. quietly come in and sort of thread it together. And to me, 
it's like a sport. My, everybody says you, you, you know, you're so calm and cool and collected and your voice is uh, soothing and all of that. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, inside it's like it's a lot going on yeah it's, yeah, yeah. it's adrenaline it's a sport all cylinders are firing i'm aware yes. of everything that's going on around me yep. and then the flow and the feeling and the all of it and I, it's it's really invigorating it's tough to like top it and if you do pack the bags and go to italy or ireland or switzerland or wherever it'll call you back yep it'll it'll that's call you thing. back it's <laughs> yeah. It's in, it's, it's in your blood and it's, and you, you really, you hit it on the head. I, I got to say, Jim, you're very right. You have an incredibly soothing voice and you're very easy to talk to. And, and, and um, I, it's really, I'm learning a lot because interviewing people is such a skill. You know, I, I tried, I, I'm working on a documentary series, for instance, and I'm interviewing people about cars. It was one of my favorite things on earth. And it's you really, it's a skill, which you're really, really good at. <laughs> I must say, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said says a million times on this show and elsewhere. My father has always said, whenever anybody says something nice to you or kind, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. Exactly. <laughs> text it right now <laughs> yeah. and address it management. Whoever management is, just Whoever address it, it is. management. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you have this wonderful. Uh, thanks for those comments. I appreciate that. You have this wonderful friendship again with. Uh, with Sean that yes, goes yes. back a ways. Yes. And uh, recently there was this oh, event too, right? Yeah. This, this event was amazing. So, <laughs> so this was such a cool event to go to because there were some people from bold and beautiful that I had known, like Kimberlyn Brown over there in the picture. Um, and then you have, you have Caroline Hennessy, whom I met working on studio city with Sean and she's become one of my absolute, one of my best friends. She is a riot. It was so cool to be there that day and support Sean to see how much he has accomplished. And he wrote a damn good book. Yes. Period. Period. It's a good book. It really has some terrific uh, material yeah. in there that can really be very inspiring and empowering. He's on his journey, his path as well, huh? Exactly. You know, exactly. Sean's on his path. And again, that's where I say, sit back a little bit and just see where life takes you in some ways. I, I'm not saying don't be ambitious, but you know, just uh, relax. I, for me, I just learned to relax a little bit, I guess. It's like, you know, Sean, how I ended up working with him is he's like, Hey dude, I, I heard that you're back in town. Do you want to come help me out? And this was last season on studio city. And I was like, dude, I'm there. And I was there and I was there and I didn't leave the whole time. And I did everything and anything I could to help out because Sean's one of my best buddies and I want to yeah. see him succeed. And he called me back for season two. Because we cool? had such a good time and we got, you know, we tripled my amount of scenes that I did and we had mm. so much fun. That I is mean, cool. He's, Tell us, he's uh, accomplishing his dreams right yeah, now. Really he cool really is. And, yeah. you know, he, he's, he's been very authentic on our show about his story and his life and yeah. coming from Pennsylvania and the whole thing. Um, yeah. Tell us about the rock stars that are with you there. I see Carolyn Hennessy, who was a guest mm -hmm. on our show recently. Right yeah. next to you, Sean there. I love Caroline. She, she is, is a hoot, isn't she? she Funny. Oh my, oh, my oh my God. If anybody missed that episode, you can see it on our YouTube channel. You must be with Carolyn good. was my guest. She's amazing. I highly suggest watching that because she is a lady with something to say that is worth listening to. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I remember like I met her. So Sean calls me in and I go and we're filming in some like guest house or some somewhere up in Hollywood. And I go in and then she comes in and she's larger than life. She's like, get my makeup on. We're filming. I got to go in a little while. And it's like, all right, here she is. And like, I think the first thing she said to my character is like, she was going to cut my balls off or something. Like she just went straight for the juggler <laughs> immediately. I was like, oh, this is how it's going to be. The, and so that's our character's relationship. The like, jugular, I, literally, I mean. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, exactly, literally. Like, I'm her nephew, apparently, but she hates me with passion. Yeah. I mean, so we developed these characters, and it was just so much fun. And I hadn't been with an actor who was so giving for a long time, you know, someone who just was like, let's make this amazing in any way that we can. Oh. <laughs> they want you oh, back on there, yeah. <laughs> You and never I, know. You I never see know. one of those ladies is on the Young and the Restless. Second from the left looks like her. Yep. Yep. She just celebrated 40 years on Young and Restless, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Tell us it's, who we're seeing in the photo here. Oh, gosh. I'm trying to. Some of okay, them, right? So, yeah. Some of them. Some people I know. Some people I don't. Sean's 
stepdaughter is first on the left, right? She's on Studio City. And then next to her, she's been on Young and Restless for 40 years. Because I know Sean was on YNR for a while after Bold and Beautiful. Then, yep, it's Kate Linder, exactly. Then we have Kimberlyn Brown, and she was on Bold and Beautiful. And I worked with her because she, her daughter on the show, tried to seduce me away from my wife. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm trying to remember what that storyline was. That was like, right, that was one of my last storylines, I think. My last storyline, I got Lorenzo Lamas ran me over with a fire truck. That was Lorenzo Lamas storyline. ran you over with a fire yeah. truck. <laughs> Who's been, who can say they've been run over by Lorenzo Lamas? Come on. I tell you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we have Sean, obviously, Annika, who apparently I'm related to on Bold and Beautiful, but I've, I'd never met her until this, obviously, because she, you know, she's, she came long after I did. Julia um, Vega is coming on our show soon, too. Oh, May. is Julia coming yeah. on? She's awesome. She's, yeah. she's a great little actress. That's been what's really, really amazing to see was, you know, I just saw some scenes that she did with Sean. Really good stuff. That'll be good. Yeah. That'll be awesome to have her on. Yeah, um, she's going to be coming on, too, yeah, which yeah. Uh, we're really excited about. Good. So so that was a great event. I know he uh, when he was on, he was uh, telling us about it. He was all yeah. excited and, uh, yeah. you know, it was something it was, uh, it was yeah. a special day, you know, um, he, he really killed it that day. He read a chapter and, and I remember us sitting there working out at the gym, like a couple of weeks before talking about what he was going to read. He's like, cause he's like, I think I might read the, uh, I think I might read this chapter, um, uh, in, um, of how he ended up on Cobra Kai. And I was like, I think you should read that too. That was one of my favorite stories from the book because oh, I mean, yeah. in all the years I'd known him, I never knew how he ended up just that drive and commitment he had. And then the injury and these things, and he's reading this and you see his emotion and he's reliving it. And I was like, dude, you are killing it. Like it was, it was good. Really cool. Isn't it? Yeah. So we have, believe it or not, while we were hey. chatting, I was also downloading, then uploading, then transferring the file from a movie <laughs> file to an MP4, all <laughs> while we were chatting. <laughs> Speaking of a million things going on at once in the background. I'm doing the production as well. and uh, But hey, you know. Thank God I have the television background. Otherwise, it might be uh, <laughs> like people are like, what opera. the heck? Yes. <laughs> So we have this, and it's a Justin clip, and if you see right on the screen, uh, Carolyn Hennessy right there too, and uh, it's about two minutes of you uh, doing your thing here, which is kind of cool, huh? Interesting. Yeah, I'm interested to see. Is this. this is this fresh? <laughs> yeah, this literally, gang. This is. We started the show just a little bit later because we were waiting for what you're looking at on the screen because <laughs> it was actually coming directly from Sean Kanan himself. Sean was actually. <laughs> putting this together we're literally just texting for each other. us right they're <laughs> texting each other and i'm talking to the viewers saying hang on talk amongst yourselves <laughs> pass around the coffee and cheesecake you know we're, we're we got some cool stuff to show you guys but we want to you know uh have it in place so we can start it and then we and you said uh you actually played director you said jim hey why don't we you you and sean actually said hey Let's just start the show anyway. Yeah, and then Sean was like, he'll, it he'll, might be a hot minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it might be a hot. He's probably banging the computer and yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> the Wi-Fi is going out. It's not downloading. He's probably uh <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. knocked a chair over or two. Um, so we wanted to get this uh, footage in place. Uh cool. and, our, and the audience was really cool because they they stuck with it and uh yeah, thank and, you guys for sticking around. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we that's our lovely squad. And then of course we have your fans uh that are merging with our uh, JMS Lovities, which I think is really, really cool. That's but awesome. uh yeah, let's take a look at this uh, nice reel that literally just got sent to us from Los <laughs> Angeles from Sean Kanan's probably living room <laughs> his, yeah, his living room in hollywood yeah yeah he just uh buddy sean, sean just sent it to us and and here it is gang and then we'll continue with our special guest all right and uh take a look at this enjoy ms winton uh christina is looking for you i think she wants to talk she wants to talk yeah. Maybe she maybe she wants to give me her recipe for Swedish meatballs. No, no, I think she maybe wants to. Maybe she wants to, to give me a facial. Go, run, tell her I'll be right there. Okay, go, okay, fly. Okay. Fly, fly, fly. Swill along, my little sidewinder. Run swiftly, my little gazelle. Fly, fly, fly. Little sparrow. Little sidewinder. Confederacy of dunces. Take a few long, deep 
breath. <laughs> to relax the mind. This is fun. This is all first season stuff. Take a slow yeah, maybe you can even uh, narrate a little bit. Tell us what. Tell the audience what we're seeing. Oh, this is this is her. I'm about to interrupt her meditation. This is the first scene Caroline and I ever yeah, shot together, and I had known her for a total of five minutes. Wait for this. Wow. <laughs> Repeat the pattern a few more times. Taking slow. Ms. Winton, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Eliza, he's been calling all day. He won't stop calling. He says he needs to speak with you. It's urgent. I said no phone calls, no interruptions. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. You interrupt me again, I will have you shaving the hair on my ass. Did you enjoy that? You want to do that again? I don't care if you are my nephew. Waste of space. Allow any tension So that's pretty much the first thing she said to me. <laughs> <laughs> there was the first meeting of, of yep. Justin and so Carolyn. <laughs> that is establishing our relationship. <laughs> That is funny. That was cool. And so now that is from Studio City? Yep, that's from Studio City. That's last season kind of leading into this season. And uh, I guess, you know, thankfully, Sean and I had so much fun last season. He called me in for this one and we had a blast. I mean, we shot it over a few days and we just just killed it. It was really cool. I'm really excited for, you know, the fans of Studio City and any people who follow Sean Cannon or what I'm doing. You know, anybody who wants to follow and watch this show because it's it's a good show and its potential is limitless is how I feel. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. With That's so be. true. You really, really are. Tell, tell yeah. us a little bit about your character for the audience watching who maybe they haven't had a chance to see Studio City yeah. yet, which you can um, see on Amazon Prime. That's where you yep, can find it's it. It's on Amazon Prime. We're doing a new season that should be releasing here pretty soon. Um, so I play a character named Jacob and uh, he is the executive producer of Hearts of Fire's nephew. Uh, you know, so Caroline's character. So I'm her nephew and I'm her personal assistant and I'm her punching bag and I'm her everything. And uh, yeah, he's uh, somebody who perhaps has been punched around a little bit for a little bit too long and maybe some exciting things will be coming for him in the future. <laughs> That's kind of what we're hoping and what we're looking at. So while you're doing that series, are you working on other things as well? I know you mentioned working on the bikes and all. Are you doing a variety of different things at the same time as doing that, filming Studio City? Yeah, you know, I the acting is now, now that the pandemic is, it's, it's, it's a dynamic thing. But, you know, right. for instance, at the peak of the pandemic, when we were in lockdown and nobody was leaving their house and all this, agents, managers, all these people, they weren't even seeing new people. Like, I mean... When I walked away, I mean, I walked away. I walked away from representation, from everything. And so it was basically impossible at the time during the, the peak of the pandemic to get representation. So now I'm kind of at a new square. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I need to get a new agent. I need to step it up. I've been, you know, I think Studio City is kind of, you know, I thank Sean for involving me because it's been a really great way to transition back into being an actor full time and pursuing that as a, as, as my passion, you know, um, and Sean facilitated that by bringing me in on this and kind of gave me the, it got me even hungrier. You know, I came back here and I was like, all right, it's time to work. This made me even more hungry because there's no place on earth. There's my two favorite places on earth are on a set and skiing or maybe driving really fast too. And now bicycles. And obviously top of this all is my wife and my family. But if you're talking passions and things, you have acting, skiing, driving, cycling. And the very top passion has been out of my life for a while and I needed that reset, but now I'm ready to enjoy what I love doing the most again, basically. I think I read somewhere that the other passion you have is being a guest on the Gym Masters show too, huh? I, uh, yes, actually, this has been an amazing day. <laughs> I, I appreciate <laughs> you having me. Uh, I, I really, I've, I've actually had a good time on this with you today because it, it's like you said, you you're really bringing back a, an art of conversation here. Like just sitting and having a conversation with somebody about life and feelings. And, you know, there's been hard times, there's been ups, there's been downs, there's been everything in life. And it's really nice to get to just share it and, mm -hmm. and talk, you know? That's it. Just shoot the breeze, casual. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it's all about. I tell everybody we yeah. don't do, you know, scripted questions or teleprompter or any of that. We just get together and we chat and we go in a lot of different directions, uh, yeah. you know, 
in life. Um, what are some other things that you would still like to do that you haven't tackled yet? Mm. I'd like to learn how to play the piano. Mm. <laughs> um, that'll be, you know, probably coming a little bit later time in my life, maybe, but that's, that's a goal of mine. I think that's one of those things that requires commitment and precision. And I like yes. that kind of stuff. Do you play any um, instruments now of any kind? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I guess you'd call a turntablist. I DJed for years and years oh, and did, years. Yeah. And I can scratch records, but you know, like actual vinyl records on a techniques turntable, you know, um, I would spend almost every August, the entirety of that month of August in Italy, going around night clubbing and DJs as, you know, as a special guest, Justin Torkelson, Rick, Rick from Bold and Beautiful. Um, and I would, you know, DJ nightclubs downtown all through my early twenties, um, you know, so that's that's where my musical sense comes in. And I think most of my favorite house music and electronic and trance music incorporates piano somehow anyway. So it's like, why not learn how to play the piano? Um, I would like to learn how to build a bicycle, for instance. Right now, I'll get on Craigslist and I do vintage bikes. So I'll find like, like uh, I, got, I got one. There's one right there. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do... Um, vintage frames but i find the frame and i collect the parts and i find the wheels and i build the wheels but i want to learn how to braise the metal together you wow. know where you put the yeah. tubes in the joints and you you're you're melting brass onto the steel so it becomes one piece that seems so cool and i that's uh that's on my agenda as well but right now my life is fully focused on building this medical testing vice company and my that's acting. incredible that's where yeah. my life is at. And I've, I'm devoting 100% of my time and resources to that right now. You mentioned your wife working in television. What are some of the yeah. things that she's working on? Well, she, um, so she's worked extensively in Israel. She worked in content locating and content, you know, so she worked with, uh, you know, like Paramount in Israel, finding yeah. shows to bring to Israel, American programs and reading yes. scripts and reading things. Um, she, a format that she created in film school and studying in Tel Aviv actually got purchased. And there's a documentary about politicians and, and the different views of politics in Israel, which is a very hot topic as it is. And so yes. she made a, an incredibly beautiful documentary. Um, and so now she's here and, you know, I mean, we got married during, so we got married probably, well, we got married the May before the pandemic. So it was May and then you have June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So is that 2019? Yeah. Yeah. So then the pandemic hits. Yep. And so that basically ruined both of our opportunities for work. So now she's looking as well. And it's really interesting because it's like, you know, she's younger than me. She's 10 years younger than me. And, and she's starting her career here, you know, and, and I'm restarting my career and we're blossoming and growing into this together in a lot of ways, which is where I was talking about, like, my life is taking a, a whole turn. I had this crazy amount of success through my 20s. And then I walked away consciously, voluntarily, and now I'm back with a different view and, and I'm tackling it with my wife and we're taking it as a, as a team and, you know, we're trying to, however we can find ways to do this and to create and to build. And, you know, that's what we want to do. I, I see her passion is in content and I want to see her getting to create, you know, that's my ultimate goal. And, and, uh, you know, again, that's the beauty of building these side hustles and these companies and things. Maybe we can start producing our own things. You know how Netflix exactly. works now. You make a show oh, and then you yeah. sell it to them. It's a whole different world now. Isn't it and something? The opportunities are limitless. Yeah. Well, that's a cool one there. <laughs> uh, this was when we were all nominated for Emmys or around at the same time. I remember, I think it was a year after, and McCook had finally got nominated. It was a family photo. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Susan Flannery and John McCook were my TV parents, if you will. Susan was my TV stepmom, but whenever I had a life question or a work question, I'd yeah. go to Susan because she was just, she was like, you know, if I'd say, hey, I, I don't feel okay with this story. Like, can should I talk to Brad? How should I do? And she'd be like, honey, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Get real here. I mean, she's just real, you know? Right. Um. And then John McCook almost stepped in like a fatherly, you know, I was, I was 18 when I first rolled into here by myself. I'd been coming to pilot seasons with my mom. I got my first apartment, a big job. It was really hard and it was scary and stressful. And I was going to say, everything. was it, was, was it fearful? Yeah. You're coming, you know, into the, yeah. the big leagues, the big leagues. It was. 
it was the big leagues and the pressure and I had left home permanently and I had to leave my high school sweetheart. And, you know, she would, we ended up breaking up because she's like, well, I don't know where I'm. And she was a year younger than me and so much pain and change and learning and emotion. And that's what I love about acting is it's a vehicle to get that emotion out. And I think all of that I felt that year yeah. came in. And like I said, all these moments come and it's a moment of synergy and all that pain was released in the scenes where I shot them and I won an Emmy. I mean, it like literally worked that way. I remember that was a turning point in my life personally, because all that pain and suffering and nerves from getting new and building my life new in Hollywood, I just let it all out right there. Like for Adrian and all of the crew and cast and 50 million people a day to see, there it was. Every bit of emotion that I had been penning up in my body for a year. You were you know? able to sort of, in a cathartic, therapeutic way, act it through Rick Forrester yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. And I think acting is a good vehicle for that. And I think yeah. that may have been a vehicle for that in my youth. Whereas growing up now, I've had the life experience. So now I have this life experience and I understand things. I feel different about my acting now. I'm more, I'm much more excited to, to share it. And I don't know, it's, it's growing up. I Are you up. easier on yourself now too? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, is that would you say that with you as well? Yeah. As you as you age, as you grow yes. in life, you right. Yes. You to be more kind and gentle. And it, it, yeah, it took me actually driving alone after a television shoot, and uh, I mentioned it multiple times. There's a long version, but the condensed version is, I was on a television shoot in Las Vegas, actually mm. west of Las Vegas in Pahrump, Nevada, and I never oh heard. Oh my of god. Do I know Perump. I never heard of Perump before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I asked the uh, at the hotel, I asked the sales manager that was there when we were having breakfast. I said, what are they known for? And she told me what one of the main businesses is in that town. And I was really, yeah. <laughs> you have to go check it out yourself, folks. It's an interesting place. <laughs> it's a very interesting. And, and uh, I think Art Bell, who used to do that late night radio show, Coast to Coast on AM yes. radio, was in Pahrump. And just a really funky place. You're driving from Vegas and you go out through the deserts and mountains and everything. And there, here is this town that pops out of nowhere, like yeah. a movie set. Like out and, of the shimmer of the heat. <laughs> and when the shoot was done and the, the camera crew, uh, I flew in from the East Coast, but they were originally with our news team on the East Coast. But now one of the guys is in uh, L.A. He mm -hmm. and the crew had to go back to L.A., but I still had like a day and a half left because we wrapped up the shoot and yeah. everything we were doing. So uh, I took the car ad hoc. Nobody knew I wasn't prepared. I'm in a rental car and there's no supplies. There's no water. The family doesn't know the cell phone isn't charged. And right. I start driving alone through death Valley in Ooh. August, two yeah. years ago, just taking that rental car. You know, who knows what's going to happen to this rental car. Is this car going to overheat, blow up? What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. And I just drove in and it was really it was really incredible because I used to place a lot of guilt on myself where if I experienced cool things like a death Valley, mm. I always had them sort of like in a monumental place. Like, Oh my God, this is death Valley. So this is, has, this has to be experienced with the loved ones and friends with us. I can't just go do this alone. It'll right. be better if the friends and family are in the car and I hear all their oohs and ahs and I'm sort of, yeah. I'm the host. I'm sort of delivering this, wonderful adventure for them. And that gives me the uh, contentment that I like is hearing their oohs and ahs. But yeah. there was none of that that could happen. This was a situation where it was me driving in, in that August heat alone in this rental car. And nobody knew I was doing it. I had no idea where I was going. Just keep going straight. And I thought I was entering the twilight zone. It was really incredible. Beautiful. I mean, picturesque and vivid uh yeah. rainbows coming out of the sky like four rainbows yeah. all at once coming out of the sky bouncing off the top of a mountain creating a copper lava looking explosion just yeah. stuff that was movie you know script quality as far as production yeah. and um it was really amazing because i at first the first 20 minutes i felt extreme self-imposed that's the thing i learned guilt mm. Mm -hmm. and the guilt was that the i wasn't sharing this with the family and friends 
So mm-hmm. maybe I should just turn back and, you know, turn the car back, go to the hotel. And uh, then I will uh, one day, who knows if you ever really do, one right. day, maybe I'll come back with the family and friends, the relatives and all, and we'll experience Death Valley together. Um, and then I felt these really um, uh, intense energies sort of make themselves known as I was driving in with that self-imposed guilt of not sharing this experience with others. Mm. And the three energies that were very, very strong were the earth. I felt the pull of the earth that were actually on this planet hanging out in a galaxy. So, right. and it took for me to be in a desert. It couldn't have been East coast city skylines. It couldn't have yeah. been my Zen place, which is the ocean. Cause yeah. we're here on the East coast and I'm, you know, in the New York area, Southern new England, and we've got the ocean here and I'm swimming, surfing, yeah. boogie boarding, sailing. I'm in, you know, your Boston relatives know the ocean yeah. is a big oh, part yeah. of this whole area and big love the, that. love the ocean. I got, you know, it calls me, it's my Zen place. So it couldn't have been the ocean. It couldn't have been a skyline city and it couldn't have been a lush forest. It had to be a stripped, hot desert. Anything can happen, sort of weird, paranormal, whatever scenario. And yeah. um, so that's that that feeling as I was starting to drive in was really intense. And then I felt the pull of the earth. I felt Mother Nature all around me. And then I felt this sense of a divine uh, mm. sort of guiding me, sort of saying, yeah. look, you know, all three of us are larger than you and we can wipe you out right now. Divine nature yep. and the earth can, you know, a tornado can come out of nowhere. Anything can happen, yep. uh, you know, but um, it's up to you. You can go back to the hotel or you can keep going with this rental. Take car. that step. Yeah. Take that step. Keep going. And I tell you, as I went in, um, that self-imposed guilt of not sharing this because I love communal experiences. I love being in a movie theater and we're all watching a uh, Titanic sink and we yeah. all feel and that feel it. All the, for the one yep. moment, you know, then everybody gets out in the, out of the theater into the parking lot and they cut each other off and give each other the finger yeah. and you know, all the yeah, rest. The one but at least yeah. in that time <laughs> when the Titanic was sinking, we all felt the same thing, yeah. which was really, exactly. really cool. But so I'm always used to that and facilitating that. And in this situation, you know, none of that can happen because I couldn't get people on the planes fast enough to get to Death Valley to join me in this. So it started to, uh, it became liberating. It started to release this guilt Mm -hmm. of not sharing such an incredible experience with others, uh, sort of released. So I I drove all the way through, drove all the way back because I knew I had the flight the next day. And people will ask, "What, what happened to you? What did you... What did you gain out of that? They said, you know, you've always had sort of this this confidence or this this comforting aura about you, but now that's just been since you came out of that experience, it's been like double and reinforced. Mm. And I said, well, there's three big things that I learned taking a rental car and driving it through Death Valley after the TV shoot. One is that there's going to be things in my life that are these types of experiences where I'm the only one in the room at that time. I'm, yeah. There's nobody else there. Yeah. And, and, and I couldn't get people there quick enough to experience it. It's happening now. It's happening in front of me. And it's a gift. Enjoy it. Yeah. Soak it up. Soak yeah. up whatever that is. The second is that um, the world is going to continue to spin on its axis, <laughs> whether I rescue it all the time and save everybody and care for everybody and run to everybody, which I've always done. That's a family trait. My family is always run to everybody else, make sure everybody's got what they need. They're happy. They're good. And then we'll fill our refrigerator type thing. Yeah. So I learned that you have to create boundaries for yourself. You have yeah. you can still be open and giving and yeah. run and, and say yes to this. And I'll help you with that project. And sure, I'll be on that shoot and I'll do this. But it's, it's, now- it, I feel like when you create boundaries for yourself, like you're saying, you can actually be more available for other people because you're not tying up so much of your energy. That's right? exactly what has happened. And the third yeah. thing that I learned, which whenever I would be on a plane, it would always sort of, you know, I'd have a little hiccup whenever I would hear them say, you know, in the event of needing the oxygen, the masks will drop, put it on yourself first, first before yeah. trying to help somebody else. Now, I was always of the ilk and always raised, help thy fellow man. Get so first. Yeah. I want to make sure you're good. You're good. Now I'll do uh, whatever's left I'll take. 
And I realize, and I've been told multiple times by people, um, that's not how it works. You have to put the mask on you. They have to put the mask on them. So you each have oxygen so you can then help each other. So I learned, put the oxygen mask on me first. The world will keep spinning whether I keep trying to save it from itself. (laughs) And that there will be experiences where I'm the only one there. And it's it's an important thing to realize it. And it doesn't mean that it's better all the yeah. time when I'm facilitating it for everybody else. So yeah. a lot of people, I said to everybody, well, why didn't this happen when I was 18 years old or 25 <laughs> years old or whatever? Right? Why they did said, this have to happen so late? <laughs> well, they said, you know, you weren't ready. You wouldn't have recognized it. It was a gift that was presented. It was an opportunity because when I was driving through Pahrump, you know, cause I like to go off like you going to Italy. I like to go off the beaten path and learn about yeah. places. And wow, it's a funky place. I don't want to just look at the strip mall that has the Bob's big boy and everything else. Right. I want to go and check out and feel this place. So when I go back, I have felt this experience. So, yeah. uh, it, it was uncanny because it was something where every time I kept making a left or a right with that car, rental car, I kept being brought to the entrance of Death Valley, which That's was so crazy. Weird. It's like it, telling you, it's like pushing this, me, this, get in yeah. there, challenge yourself, take the risk, stripped earth, hot as hell. Yeah. You cannot have any creature comforts, none of yeah. that. No family, no loved ones with you. It's you, the car, and yourself. It's a yeah. self experience. <clears throat> Coming out of, out of that, your comfort zone a little bit. You're too. stepping out of the comfort zone, yeah. which by doing that, has allowed me to do that on many different occasions. Uh, we ended up in Greece on another television show project, a lifestyle travel series that I host, co-host. And um, one minute I realized I'm on Samothraki Island in the North Aegean Sea, and we're swimming in this black pool of water with a waterfall and these wow. cliffs around us. And it, they were filming it. And the producer was up on the mountain and he's, he's filming us and he's like, guys, we want you to slide in there because we want to get that perfect shot. And there were these locals that took us through the woods to this, this pool of water, which was incredible. And Samothraki is a very rugged island, but a beautiful island. It's where the Nike gods come from and everything. Yeah, yeah. You look across, you can see Turkey seven miles away. We're swimming in the Aegean Sea. It's, it's beautiful. But there was no way to access this black pool of water without sli- literally sliding off these boulders into it. Yeah. And but at first you're kind of like, what's in the water? It's pitch black. <laughs> there's not what's even, it's, there? and, it's, and <laughs> it's still, there's no ocean waves. There's no river flow. It's yeah. not a lake that has a ripple from a boat that passed by. It's yeah. still, and there's this big cliff here and the waterfall is coming down. Yeah. And we're like, uh, what? Is, and it is the coldest water I've ever been in my entire life. I've never been in more frigid water. I can take the shower and make it as cold as I want. It will and never it match. Yeah. This yeah. was still black, deep, cold water. But they wanted the shot of us in it, you know, for the aesthetics of, of you know, covering this island. Yeah, and yeah. we did it. And it was so cold. And because it's fresh water, you know, you don't float. Yeah, so you just, so you're, in. you're tightening up, you know, your chest is tightening. You're trying to get yeah. air because it's frigid. And yeah. then the girls that, that took us, the, myself, the other guy and the camera crew and the producer through the woods to find this. I mean, it was really beautiful. I mean, people came from other countries and it was a really beautiful hid- hidden place on the island. Yeah. But uh, as we're like in the middle of it, floating in the middle of it or trying to float the girls then yell out to us oh by the way guys we want to tell you something we're like sure what they've never been able to find a measurable bottom <laughs> so, all of so a you're sudden, literally swimming in a bottomless pit <laughs> so all of a sudden we're like wait a minute not only is it jet black frigid and eerie and what's else What's in here? Is there a snake? A is there a Loch Ness yeah, exactly. monster going to come out? Yeah. Does this lead to hell? Is there going to be a sudden, <laughs> sudden like whirlpool that's going to start and suck us under? What's going yeah. on here? So they waited till we they were we were in the middle to tell us there is no measurable bottom. And suddenly, when you're in the middle of a 
body of water like that and they tell you that they've never been able to find a bottom to it, it changes things quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, the but, the, but the bottom line, they got the shot they wanted. And you did it. Yeah, they right. The, shot. <laughs> the producer, you know, hanging off a sandy like uh, pathway, he almost slipped off and the camera oh, person almost slipped off the cliff into the water. I mean, oh we're, we're in this water and we're seeing him slipping and he's trying to grab onto things. Dude, like, oh my the God. Camera, the camera would still be sinking to this day. It would still be gone. <laughs> and you know, it, the, the, uh, he slipped and almost fell, but held on to that camera. That camera wow. was like gold, yeah. you know, held on to the camera. And uh, it, it was just really, really an amazing experience. But I wonder if I would have just did that haphazardly if I didn't do the Death Valley yep. first. Well, yeah, these the experience, they beget experiences. And then you say, okay, I'm open to this more, right? Exactly. But I got last summer, I got to meet my new my new in-laws in Israel because during the pandemic, we, my wife got to go home during the first pandemic uh, holidays, you know, Christmas and Hanukkah and all that. But we weren't registered as married in Israel, for instance, so I couldn't go. So I was really, so I had my Christmas pandemic by myself, which was like got total Lord of the Flies around here. It was insane. And, and then um, uh, the next summer, I finally got to go back and I finally got to go to Israel with my wife and, and meet my new family and, and travel. And in our travels, we went to the Dead Sea. And on the way back from the Dead Sea, we stopped at Masada and it's this plateau and it's an ancient roman and jewish fort that had been fought over years and this and that but what was amazing about it, it reminded me of your death valley experience it was in august it was like 120 degrees the tour person who sold us the ticket to ride the cable car to the top of this mountain it's a mountain fortress you must have thought we were crazy there was not a single other soul up there on top except me and my wife and like 107 to 112 degree heat in august walking this you know walking these biblical steps where romans have been and where you know and then you could see where you know the romans had come in and then the jews came and kicked them out and then the romans yeah. were coming back and you, the whole story and you can see these names scribbled on the walls of the people who were killed all these hundreds of years ago and you know being there by ourselves just the two of us and sharing this experience and feeling the heat and the oppressiveness and all of this and saying this is what people would have experienced back then it just blows your mind i mean it was it was such a that was a life-changing experience the whole israeli trip was a life-changing experience but that really was like you know and then the dead sea was amazing because i mean come on it's you know it's the weirdest thing you literally float on top it's it's so incredible isn't it <laughs> yeah, i've yeah. always i've seen it and i've always wanted to try it because it's just like you know. it's so weird it's you, you put your you cannot jump in like if you jump, if you dive in, you bob out like a cork. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing. It was really cool. But um, but when you were telling that Death Valley story, I felt yeah. the same thing. We were on top of this plateau with all these ancient ruins, and it was just my wife and I, and really nobody else, you know. And except I think the cable guard, the cable, you know, the cable car guy was there at the bottom. But we had this whole place, and you know, it could have been, oh, it's too hot. I don't want to do this. But it was like, no, let's go experience this, and we. We, you know, we experienced Jerusalem that way too. You know, I, I, I'm not mega religious, but I, you know, my family is, was raised, I was raised Catholic school and this and that, but I'm not particularly religious myself, but we got to see the, the tomb of Jesus and go in and, you know, our friend who was kind of giving us this tour of the place, he's like, and he's a professional tour guide and he's a family friend and he's giving us the tour. He's like, I've never seen it like this and you will never see it again. There was like eight other people in the entire church of the Holy Sepulchre. He said, it's usually 50,000 people here and we have to make them sign waivers that say, we cannot wow. guarantee you get even get into the church, you know, and then going to see the history there, the layers, you know, you have a church, you have a, you know, a church with, with a mosque on top of it, built another thousand, you know, hundred years later with, with, you know, a synagogue built on top of that. And I mean, this crossroads of history and like, there's some life changing stuff to go yeah. and experience that and experience it that in that way, because there were no tourists there. I was only allowed because we got a special visa because I was married to my wife. So we saw Jerusalem almost privately in a way you know? that most people don't get a chance to experience it, which made it probably extra deep and extra oh, special. Yeah. Huh? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, when we left the church, I was like emotional because I was thinking yeah. about my grandma because she was super Catholic. And yeah, yeah. How much she would have just been blown away to have that experience. You know, even my wife felt it. You know, it's like, yeah, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience to see it that way. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's, that's cool. So, you know, like, you know, setting the boundaries and, yep. and, and doing things that speak to the essence of who you are as well, yeah. that you learned, you don't have to say yes to everything and you can pick yeah. and choose a little bit more, which I've Isn't learned it freeing to do when you can start saying no, I, 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 spent you know, my entire I always, that was not that, saying I, no. Right. I <laughs> was yeah. always like, if you say no, they're going to go away. That's yeah, going to end. They'll never be my friend that, again. They yeah. will never <laughs> offer that or that role again, that gig again, They'll, they won't want to work yep. with you again. They will, if you ever say can't or, you know, e yeah. even in the beginning, it's, it's sort of like you, um, you ease off it almost like you're coming out of some sort of a, uh, you know, yeah. um, one of those anonymous type things uh, <laughs> where you're like you, so you use words that you don't start with no, yeah. you know, say, yeah. I'll, I'll take a look or let yeah. me circle back. Or we'll I gotta no check. A, I gotta check a few things first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I would love to. Absolutely. I just gotta say, I may have something else that day, but I will. I will check. You know, you start with all yeah. that first, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then eventually, before you, you say no, <laughs> before you actually say the no's, right? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you realize, like I said, the Earth keeps spinning. Yeah, and that's no. another. That's another big thing when you realize that 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 your head is not the sun and the earth is not going this way. <laughs> when that realization comes, it's freeing. Cause you're like, Oh, right. right. Those people yeah. who I thought really cared about this and that, and this, they don't really care. They're more concerned with their own life. And that's freeing too. Right. Like when yes. you realize people are really not thinking about you as much as you yes. might think they are. And it's all right. arrogance to think that, you know, it's, it's amazing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And yeah. some of them, you know, they sort of, uh, They'll drop off the face of the earth because you're not running to their aid and to their salvation all the time. Yeah, they actually yeah. have to do it themselves now. But what yeah. it does is it brings in, like you say, this whole new energy of all these other people yeah. who want you at their party. They want to work with you. They want to collaborate with you. They love the energy. They love the, you know, whatever the confidence is or whatever it yeah. is you're delivering, whatever you're putting out that pretty much is on autopilot. You don't even know. You're just doing yeah. you. You're just yeah, being, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim's being Jim, Justin's being Justin. We're just yeah, yeah. doing ourselves, but whatever, it, however it touches people in the different ways it does, it's a beautiful thing. And yeah. uh, sometimes we don't even realize we're doing what we're doing, but it's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was chatting with the, the mother of one of my very best childhood friends who passed away recently. And oh, I was chatting with his mom. And, uh, you know, and I was telling her, I was like, I feel like over these past years of my life, I've grown up. You know, I've, I've been adulting and that's what it is. It's like, she's like, well, what is adulting? What is growing up to you? And it's like, to me, it was like, you're finding a sense of self-confidence and you're finding a sense of yourself and, and who yourself is, is not really that dependent on what other people's opinion of yourself is. Right. And when you can pass these points and I'm not, I still struggle with it. I, I think sure. that's an eternal yeah. struggle right. with your ego and with your life and this and that. But the more you can learn to let go and to do these things, the more freeing it is. Because right. then you really get the space to be yourself. Like, I don't know, for me, I feel like I'm entering like the Renaissance of Justin. Like I, I'm finding who I am and now I'm, I'd like to share that if I can't, exactly. if I'm so fortunate, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that could be possibly why I started this series too, was, you know, because I'm working with the television crew and the television stations and, and the production yeah. companies and the networks and all, and, and you're, doing what is their sort of vision and yeah. you know what I mean? And then you yeah. sort of create your own thing. Uh, you still do all of that because you love it and you're good at it and you appreciate exactly. it, all, all the traditional formatted stuff. But then you yeah. sort of come out of the box and throw up uh, your own thing and yeah. see where it lands, see if people respond to it. And it's kind of cool when, when they do, you know what I mean? So it sounds like right. you're, you're doing your thing and enjoying it while still doing the things, you know, that you have always done, yeah. but you're, you're able to do it on your terms in certain ways, which I think is a great thing, right? Yeah. I, I feel like it is. You're right. It's like when you start doing things on your own terms, it's a pretty exciting thing. 
you know? Yeah, and right. I mean, I, I have so many ideas now and this energy and excitement in my life that was lacking for a while. And now yeah. it's coming back and the pandemic's, you know, winding down. So we have more opportunities. And so like, I'm trying to take that energy and just let it all in. I, I'm going to start a YouTube channel for my bikes. I build a bike every week. Why not film it? It's Why a great not? Idea. People are into that stuff, you know, it's, it, but it's like, all these little things, you know, it's, it's, I never thought I'd be in the medical industry. I never thought I'd be doing this, but here's where life's taking me and I'm going to ride with it, you know? Yeah. Pun intended with the bikes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pun intended. I'll stay on the bicycle from now on, but yes. <laughs> but what about, you know, you've, you've seen comments throughout the night about uh, soap operas and returning. Yeah. Is there any yeah. thought of, or did you ever have the other, I mean, there's not many left. There's only a few solid yeah. soap operas that remain yeah. there used to be so many have you yeah. had an inkling uh of, of thought or have has anybody approached you to say hey come on general hospital come on this come on that days of our you life know, that, that's definitely something that would be i would love to do um you know again as i said i'm literally just now starting to test the waters and see where this is i you know i um it's really fun to see the comments from people today and and on my instagram and stuff of people saying come back to bold and beautiful which is something i would definitely consider and really be love to do especially if sean was there if we could if we could just mess with each other for a while and, and fight with each other that would be really fun um but it's that's always a possibility I, you know general hospital would be something i love like you know general hospital is is known as is some really good storyline you know and it's a different environment i'd like to experience those different environments to work in too um you know, I, when, when I first left Bold and Beautiful, the idea was like to do some films and I wanted yeah. to see something from beginning to end, you know, and I right. did, I, I did a lot of indie films with friends and we made our own projects and I paid for a film and we did this and that. And it's fun to see something in its closure, but there's something to be said about something like Bold and Beautiful, you know, over 35 years now, it's going and going and going, what's up Angie? And um, it's just going and it's really special to be a part of that. Oh, thank you, Mona. Thank you so much. I don't know. If, maybe you'll see me again on BNB. <laughs> That's so cool to see those comments. <laughs> the, the support from the fans has always been amazing. There, there's also, you know, the people in Europe, Angelique, there's some people, they just support. They just, right, exactly. And they, and they, they're there. They're like your ride or die fans. They uh, support whatever you yes. do. It's the most amazing thing. It's fantastic. Isn't it? It's the icing on the cake. It is yeah. really the, the believers. It makes it all worth it when when somebody comes up and you know sometimes you're on a soap and 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 in this in this industry people are like oh you're on a soap or whatever and it's like this or that you know but sometimes you're there but when someone comes up and you're like hey you got me through a really tough time because you're there in their living room every single day people have dealt with medical issues and these things and you're like you really helped me through a tough time yes right and it's like that really hits you because it's like that's why you want to do this. You yeah. want to inspire or move somebody in some way. You some know, of the why most moving artists. Exactly right. And some of the most moving moments too, is when a soap star um, actually passes away and they write that into the storyline, the, the yeah. actual actor or actress yeah, yeah, yeah. in real life does die. They passed away and they actually write that into the storyline. And you can look back. Uh, there's so many episodes where uh, you saw, like, I remember, was it, because um, it was all in the news and, you know, we, we, in the, being in this industry, we sort of follow it, all the different areas of the industry. When um, Francis Reed passed away, who played Alice Horton on Days of Our Lives yeah. since the beginning with McDonald yeah. Perry since day Legendary. one. Yeah. And then she actually passed away in real life. And you could see the raw emotion in yeah. all of the actors and actresses, how difficult, I mean, they had a coffin, they had the picture, Ooh. they were in a cemetery and they were all placing roses yeah. on the coffin and they were all speaking from their heart. And you could Nobody's see acting there. those yeah. tears were real tears of a deep yeah. loss. And yeah. um, have you experienced that um, in, in some of these roles too, where it can get really... It's yeah. intense. And sometimes you have to even separate yourself from the character because yeah. you can get lost in what's happening. Yeah. It's, um, it's, that's happened a couple of times. I tend to get a little bit method sometimes with my acting. Um, you know, the character of Rick was interesting because he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, 
that challenging of a character always, you know, he had his moments, right, you know, losing right. the children and this and that, but a lot of times he was talking business and he was more the facilitator of the drama, you know, like the, 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 like Amber would be fighting with her cousin and Rick would be, or, her, or yeah. And, you know, Rick would be trying to break it up. It would be, you know, right. so you'd get these few moments every now and then, like the stuff that I won my Emmy for, where it was like, it all came together, my emotions and my stuff, it all was there at once. And that was, that was real emotion coming out. I was just linking a different form, a different bit of pain yeah. to relate it to losing a child. Cause I was a 19 year old kid. I'd never even considered having a child, let alone lost a child. So right. how do you relate? How do you find a way to relate? Um, you know, I remember I was doing a, uh, a little indie film with a buddy of mine, a director friend of mine called knife. No, it was a, it was called evolver. And it was like a, I was playing like kind of an anti-hero kind of thing. Like, you know, everybody, when they're born, they get a chip placed in their neck and it's supposed to be like Facebook in your brain, but it's destroyed the world. And it's, you know, it's destroyed my sister. So I decided to hack the system and take everybody down. And so he's like a hacker kind of thing. And, and I remember like, I got really into it and we're filming and then I'm <laughs> in filming, I like break my ankle and like all this. So then I'm back in the cast on painkillers and we're still filming it. And I'm like, let's go. We're, you know, yeah. the director's like, Just slow down, bro. And I'm like, we have to shoot the yeah. running. I'll run. He's like, you have pins in your ankle, man. Like you're not running. Mm. And I was like, come on, I want this emotion. This pain is driving me. He's like, yeah. take a step back take and just take back. a breath. We don't need to go that far. We can shoot you sitting down working in the computer. You don't need to run through the hallway anymore. You know, it was like, um, I remember at one point in time, I was actually trying to option um, Kurt Cobain's story with Courtney mm. Love. And the price just went, you know, it was 12 million and then it was 18 million and then it was 20 million and then it was 50 million. And I'm like, I'm not going to, uh, how can I give you 50 million for this story? But I was trying to prepare for the role too. And I think it was the same thing. I got really dark places. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Right. And I remember like, I remember like my mom and dad, they were like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah you're yeah. getting a little heavy you don't even own this story yet like right I was like, yeah but i this is a key this could be a key role you know it was like a bit too much but it's it's hard to not get really involved at another one to actually when i met my wife i was doing an independent film with a friend of mine and he wanted to shoot a short film in complete black and white on film mm. with this 1950s french camera on 35 where i'm playing an alcoholic climbing up a mountain to kill myself i'm going to jump off the mountain Mm. And it was interesting because at that point in my life, I was going through some struggles, not alcohol or anything, but just, you know, depression. I was having some tough times and a lot of changes happening in my life. And so it all intersected and it was getting really real. And, uh, you know, he's like, you, you have, he's like, you've got to look bad. And I'm like, all right, I'm taking this seriously. So like when I met my wife, I weighed 142 pounds. Like mm. I normally weigh 160 to 170. I weighed 142 pounds. I was on my elliptical for four and a half hours a day. I was eating 600 calories a day. I wasn't sleeping. I had grown my hair down to here and I had grown my beard out huge. Mm. And I just, I don't know what she saw in me when our first, on our first date when we met, but. You just described Jesus. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I just described Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was, uh, I went full on, you know, like, uh, I don't know. What's his face? Um, Batman, Chris, uh, what's his face? Oh, uh, yeah. He did the machinist, you know, and he like got down to a hundred pounds and, whatever. Yes. and everyone's like, yeah, they paid him $10 million to do that. Don't take do yourself that. to the hospital for an indie film. And I was like, well, it'll be cool. It'll be fun. And I remember like being weak and climbing this mountain and like worrying about falling off. Like it was nuts, but I was going to stick to it through the end. And I'll never, I don't think I'll ever do that again. Like that was a bit much. Like yeah. I was sick. By the end yeah. of that, I was ill. You're People totally... were like, you, you look really bad. I was like, that's the idea. And they're like, no, no you look really bad. <laughs> well, you, Justin does. Forget yeah, the character, yeah. but Justin yeah. does. Yeah. Exactly. So you learn, you know, everything to sort of balance things out. And uh, how do you, uh, how do you calm yourself uh, when things do get a little nerve wracking? What are some of the Zen places, Zen things that you do to balance all the demands and the, the pulling, uh, do we want Justin here? We need Justin here. How does Justin sort of settle and frame that and, and balance that? Mm, if, if it's something I need immediately, I've gotten really good at breathing exercises. <laughs> breathing know, is just, huge. We always forget to breathe. They tell yeah, us you, you're not breathing, you're breathing from here, but you got to breathe yeah, from the diaphragm. You're breathing here, you got to breathe down here and you got to fill up your belly like a balloon and you got to feel like you're going to pop. And, uh, I, I remember learning breathing to do Shakespeare when I was a teenager because, you, you know, these soliloquies and these things where you're learning breathing rhythm and you have to take these huge deep breaths. But somewhere in like my 20s and anxiety and all this, I started breathing from my chest and I started, 
you know, like nerve it. And, you know, I remember one time somebody was like, you got to breathe, dude. And I, so I started practicing breathing exercises. You know, if I have more time and I'm really stressed, I get on my bike and I'll go ride 60 miles in a couple hours and I'll just ride as hard as I can until I'm almost sick. And then I come back and I feel better or do some acting, do some writing with my wife or something, yeah. you know, just get a creative outlet. Usually if something's wrong inside, it's signaling that you have to make a little change. And yes. Sometimes it's just a, sometimes it's just a tiny little change. Like my stomach right. tells me when something's not right. It's like a little feeling up in the yeah. Mine, the mine is the stomach. Yeah. 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 And it's like something's not right, and maybe it's just a tiny little shift. It doesn't have to be a monumental shift in how you look. It's just a little change. Exactly. Yeah. Changes everything, but it's tiny. We had this woman come from the east, from Arizona, actually, to the East Coast for a television news segment, an interview in the studio in New York yeah. that I did recently. She's a she's a specialist in PhD in uh, physiognomics. And oh, cool. that's really cool stuff. And that's, uh, she can actually sort of size up a lot about you just by looking at the shape of your face and just the whole thing. And she said for me, this is why I'm tying into what you're saying as far as the stomach. She said, Jim, you are cerebral mm -hmm. and abdominal. <laughs> I've heard so you, like that they are very connected. There's like a yep. highway that connects the yep. two and you're very cerebral in terms of, you know, empathetic, intuitive, and just always thinking and creating your cerebral and abdominal. So you feel things in the really uh, stomach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. feel like it's like that. That's where that it sounds like you about. are too. Yeah, I am. I think I, I'm feeling what you're saying. It's like that when someone says, oh, that must be a punch in the gut. I'm like, yeah, I really feel that. You can actually feel it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, I've, yeah. It's just funny. You've said that. I've had people say that, you know, too, as well. I, I remember a shrink told me that once they're like, you have some sort of connection yeah. here yeah. where you're very, you know, your anxiety, your everything, it all connects right. through here. It all connects. So I know when something goes here, that it's going to go here next. So I'm like, right. it's time to pay attention to what's happening around me. <laughs> so next time you're hanging out with friends and they bring any of that up or experts, you're talking to experts just say, well, of course I'm cerebral and abdominal. <laughs> I love this. I'm cerebral and abdominal. This Physiognomics. Thank you. I love this. I love this. <laughs> That's what it is. I tell you. Well, this was really great. My friend, we, we yes. chatted, would you believe we chatted for almost two hours? No, I, I was, I just saw in the corner. I was like, are you serious? I don't know if Sean told you. Yeah, we have, uh, you know, we, like I said, we don't script it. We let it roll. Guests come on for as long or short as they need or want. Yeah. Uh, usually they end up staying longer because it's just comfortable. But, you know, if it was 20 minutes or a half hour, I mean, what we don't really do is just say, tell us about the book, the CD, the movie, and then out. Because yeah, that's yeah, yeah. just typical factory assembly line stuff. Yeah. You know, we That's not the art of the conversation. <laughs> that's not really the art of the conversation, exactly. And, yeah. and somebody who really understood that, who usually pops in towards the latter part, is Mr. George Burns with us this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> What's up, George? <laughs> there he is with his cigar. <laughs> I tell you this, uh, my, I say it all the time. My aunt collected dolls, my aunt in Connecticut, she collected dolls. And uh, so when he turned 100, she made sure she got the uh, exclusive collectible <laughs> George Burns doll, doll and it. Uh, it got passed down to me. And so he pops in every once in a while. Uh, he's hey, always here. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, and he played God too <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there he is. And he said, uh, you knocked it out of the park. He had an awesome time. He learned a lot. And uh, he said, uh, you know, keep going, kiddo. <laughs> hey, I got to thank you so much for having me on today. I learned a lot today, too. I, uh, uh, what an I experience. Cool stuff, huh? Well, definitely yeah. like Sean did, spread the word, tell everybody, you know, you know, they're welcome to come on uh, the Gym Masters show live and we always have a good time and talk about cool things and life and uh, what they're up to. And it's just a great, um, you know, a great time. Maureen in Arizona says, what a fun conversation this has been, Justin. Oh. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. I wish you well with everything that lies ahead. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Merlin watching in Ontario, Canada. Uh, thanks, Justin. Very entertaining evening. And of course, Angie, uh, Justin, have a great week. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. I think Angie was also here when Sean was here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
cool Angie, stuff. Angie is such a supporter. She is, she is a, she's like a fan club sort yeah. of uh, yeah, she's, president she's or top at the end. She's, she, and she's uh, primarily follows Sean and, and, and uh, has become friends with me as well as everybody. So she's, we're, we're, we're now all in the, uh, well, we're all in the Lovety Hall world here on the Jim Master Show. You're in yeah. it. She's in it. We're, we're now I'm we're in, in the, the Lovety world now. I'm going to watch. I love this. <laughs> yeah, it's it. You're a Lovety now. And uh, they yeah. already said that earlier. The viewers said, he's a Lovety. Well, I say, you know, I say it all the time. You can get Oscars and Grammys, Tonys, Tellies, Peabody's, uh, all of these fantastic Emmys. But when you get a lovely on the Jim Master Show live, I mean, that's that's like, I mean, you've got the Emmy, yeah, exactly. has it make, but the lovely, it's right up exactly. there, isn't it? Exactly. Yes, it is. It's right up there. One of the best interviews I've had in a long time. Definitely. I appreciate that. Mona is in Louisiana, New Orleans. It's just thanks, Jim and Justin, for an entertaining for entertaining us tonight. It was great. Please come back. Hope to see you on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mona. You never know. You never that's know. It. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. We appreciate that. And <laughs> Kathleen in New York City, this has been fun. Thank you, Justin and Jim. Yes, J and J Productions here tonight. <laughs> Justin yeah, and Jim. Yeah, exactly. No, Sue is amazing, my friend. Uh, good luck on everything that you're doing. You. And uh, is there a website or anything people can uh, follow along your you know, adventures? Um, I, I have a website. Um, it's kind of put it together now. My Instagram, I, I, you know, you can always follow my adventures on Instagram. It's just yeah. Justin underscore Torkelson. It's my name. That's the best place to find me because Insta is kind of where it's at right now and in, in our world, as I'm sure you know. I mean, this is all new to me as well. You know, I write people are like, well, how many Insta followers do you have? I'm like, honey, I got out of television before Instagram was a thing. I'm well, it's, it. it's, exactly. <laughs> it was right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like yeah. everybody coming out. I was on CBS on the Bold and the Beautiful. I was yeah, on exactly. network television. That still yeah. matters. Yeah, it matters. <laughs> I promise. It, it still matters. I mean, yeah. I I know what CBS Television City looks like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, isn't it amazing? From CBS Television City, that incredible iconic place, and and uh, yeah. Thirty Rock for NBC, to now. Uh, your cell phone in your bedroom. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's Just, it's like the world is such a different place. It's I, incredible. I, I think it opens up though. I mean, it's so much more room for creativity. Like, look at what you've created during the pandemic. There's so much more room that we can build things. It's amazing. And to sort of extend ourselves, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, spread the word if you know of other folks you think would like to pop on the show, my friend. And I will. This was really terrific and. Uh, I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you, Justin. I loved it. Thank you, Jim. Oh, it was my pleasure. Good luck with everything. Say hi to Sean for us. Will Let do. him know we got the footage in and on just in time. I will. I'll see him this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he'll be hopping on again as well. And he's a great guy and uh, a good soul, just like you. And uh Best of luck with everything. Congratulations on all the new things that are happening in your life. And thanks Thank for uh, being so open and authentic with us on the show as well. It was really cool. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, anytime, my friend, anytime. You're welcome back. We'll keep the porch light on for you, okay? All right. Thanks, Justin. Take care. Thank you, guys. You Thank you, everyone, for watching. Absolutely. Be well. Yes, wasn't that fantastic, gang? Joining us here live from Los Angeles, California with an epic conversation. We always have epic conversations here on the show. Justin Tolkinson joining us here. You know him again from The Bold and the Beautiful, of course, as Rick Forrester and starring with Sean Kanan in Studio City. That's right, which is incredible. You can see that on Amazon Prime which is really, really fantastic. Hey, quick reminder, gang, if you didn't see the episode when Marion Ross was here, yes, Marion Cunningham from Happy Days. A lot of people watching that. That was an excellent episode. See it on our YouTube channel. Also, Stanley Livingston, you know him. He played Chip Douglas on My Three Sons. He stopped by the Gym Master Show. So did his brother, uh, Barry Livingston, who played Ernie. Yeah, he was here as well. Judy Norton was with us. She, of course, was Mary Ellen on The Waltons. You can see that on our YouTube channel. Henry Lamar, the incredible celebrity illustrator and graphic designer. I mean, look at the screen. Look at those illustrations of the Golden Girls, Judy Garland, Carol Burnett, uh, Lucio Ball. He's absolutely incredible. Did you see when Cousins Gibb were here, when Nick Endicott Gibb was here and he opened up? about his uh, search for his biological father who turned out to be Morris Gibb of the Bee Gees. 
Morris, Robin, and Barry, and his father turns out to be Morris. That's an incredible episode. A lot of people watching that on our YouTube channel as well. Scott Dreyer was here, actor, singer, voice artist, author, part of the Doris Day Project. He was a real close friend of Doris Day. Even did voices for Sonic the Hedgehog. That was a great episode as well, if you saw that. How about the episode with Lawrence Juber, Grammy-winning guitarist, composer, arranger, who was in Wings with Paul McCartney. He was on our show as well. These are just some of the folks that have stopped by the Gym Master Show Live. There's 650 episodes just about. Coming up Friday, Joe Finfera, another fantastic actor and model. He's going to be joining us from Los Angeles as well. He's in a lot of Lifetime movies and projects as well. And uh, he's excited about some new things that he's working on. So it's really cool stuff. And again, we thank Justin for joining us here on the show, gang. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, it's easy breezy. It costs nothing. Just click that uh, red button there, that lovely button, that subscribe, and uh, click the notification bell so you never miss any of the amazing episodes right here on the Gym Master Show Live. Now, if you missed any of this episode with uh, Justin, don't fret. We uh, archive them all on our YouTube channel for you. So make sure you uh, check that out uh, and check out all the binge watch, all the other episodes. Enjoy yourself. Don't forget to give this episode a like and uh, leave a comment on the YouTube channel as well. We love that. And as we always say, find your Zen place. Mine is the ocean. That's the Atlantic. That's the South shore actually of Long Island, New York. And that's the Atlantic. So fine. And I can't wait. It's We're almost at the time where we can dive into the ocean. It's getting warmer and warmer. Not quite yet. <laughs> Soon. Uh, maybe around Memorial Day, we'll be in the ocean doing our thing. But find your Zen place. We talked a lot about that today with uh, Justin. Like you guys know, our show goes in so many different directions, and uh, and we love it. And we love all of you. I'm looking at some of these comments coming in here. Uh, <laughs> Sue goes, I wish I had the energy you two have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, you have a good conversation, and you, you let it roll, and it's really fantastic. And uh Kathleen Walker says, thank you, Jim. Have a great night. Good night all to you, Kathleen, as well. And uh, Angie, thank you very much. Keep spreading the word about the Gym Master Show live. We love that. Tell everybody you know to subscribe to our channel. That really helps us. And it's so cool to have you here as well. Merlin says, relax. You too, Merlin in Canada. Christine Clifton says, thanks, Jim, for this entertaining show with Justin. He was so open with his life. Enjoyed his many interesting stories. This is a superb actor and human. Great upcoming shows as well. Yeah, we got so many. Uh, let's see. Paul Green is going to be with us next week. He is Dr. Carson Shepard in When Calls the Heart on, um, is it? Yeah, Hallmark. Hallmark, the Hallmark channel. And uh, he's a friend of mine. He was on our show in the past. He and I worked together at Carnegie Hall. He's on the show next week. Yeah. Really exciting. And uh, Michael Lerner is going to be with us. Yes. She played the mom on the Waltons. She's coming up. There's so many incredible guests that are coming up here on the show and um, just keep spreading the word. And as you guys know, we have guests that come in from all walks of life. We had Patrick McEnroe on the show, the ESPN tennis commentator, and um, his brother, John McEnroe, actually stopped by for a bit on that episode. Mona says, uh, good night, Jim and Lovett. great show tonight. This was fun. Hope uh, everyone has a great night. You as well, Mona, in Louisiana. And we're still using all those spices that you sent me from New Orleans and everything else you sent. Still those coffees that you sent was great. And I just got another package in from Ann Wozniak in Jacksonville. And I think it's another package of those chocolate covered pecans in and remembers you know south carolina she said they grew up in south carolina and they used to have these pecan trees and she and her siblings would pick the pecans from their family's pecan trees and bring them to this big place that would turn them into pecan delicacies and chocolate covered and everything else and i we just picked up a package today that came from and, and I think there's some more pecan treats in it. Uh, absolutely, Angie, I agree. You're excited. Paul Green, my buddy's coming on. Again, He, you know him from Hallmark Channel. He's amazing. And uh, as I said, we worked together uh, on stage at Carnegie Hall, um, which was fantastic. Uh, even though each day 
might be a struggle. What better way to end it than spending time with Sir James of Lovety Hall? Thanks, Jim, for giving us this break from the craziness. You know, a lot of people have said that. Thank you, Maureen. I appreciate that. A lot of people have written to me privately, you know, on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, email, telling me, uh, leaving comments on our YouTube channel, which we encourage about how this series has just not only entertained you, we have a lot of laughs on this show too, and entertainment and uh, poignant moments. And that's what's cool about it. We don't call it an interview show. We call it an entertainment lifestyle variety talk show series, bringing back the uh, old school talk show style, but with a modern vibe and a modern twist of today. We're going to get ready to duck out. Would you believe I have not eaten? I need to eat something. <laughs> We're going to have something uh, in just about a minute. Haven't had lunch or dinner today. It's been such a busy day. And tomorrow, speaking of Boston, Justin mentioned Boston. We have a lot of relatives in New York and New England as well. I'll be in Boston all day. We have two TV shoots in Boston tomorrow. Uh, and it's for the Restaurant Lifestyle TV series. So I'm going to be sampling lots of food in Beantown. And I can't wait to do that. So we'll be in Boston all day. Uh, but we will be back Friday with uh, Justin was with us today. And we thank him. He was awesome, wasn't he? Again, you can see this episode again. Uh, check check it out. Share the link. Joe from Farrow is going to be with us live from LA as well. And uh, cool stuff. So we're going to sign off, gang. We love you all. Thanks for being with us. Um, good night, Jim and all. Lovely. See you next week to let you know she's going to be in New York City. Fantastic. Enjoy safe travels to the Big Apple. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it is Easter weekend. So we're going to be off for Passover and Easter weekend. We're going to be off. It's going to be nice, some downtime, some family time. You know, I'm always running seven days a week and then we do this series. So it's going to be nice to chill out and enjoy some, you know, what, colored Easter eggs and malted balls <laughs> and some ham and all that usual good stuff. All right, gang. So this is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. And of course, um, I'll be in Boston. So that'll be fun tomorrow. Maybe we'll shoot you some uh, Facebook video of me uh, with all the food around me and everything. We're going to be in Quincy, Massachusetts and in Boston. So it's going to be cool. But, uh, thanks for all these comments. Thanks for all the love and all of the, uh, love at E and we will see you on the next episode. Now we don't say goodbye here. We always say, see you later. So we say, see you later. Slancha, cheers, uh, shalom, Avita Zane, Sayonara, Moy Loop, which we know in African is walk well. We say all of that. We'll see you on the next one, okay? Be well, take care, love one another, be good to one another. And I'll be waiting here for you in this chair, in the host chair for the next episode of the Gym Master Show Live. Thanks for being with us. We love you all. Take care and cheers.